Excellent. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, your exam is Thursday the 21st. Uh, and so of course, this is your last week in the study. Uh, the physio X's that are due on Tuesday are a good thing that will keep you busy and help you with the material. Uh, but also remember, you do have the lecture slides. You do have the outlines that tell you the things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, for instance, there are four um, uh, transportation pathways that I guarantee one of them is going to be on the exam that we'll talk about on Tuesday. And so there's no reason you couldn't look at those ahead of time. Uh, and uh, again, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of today's lecture too. Uh, so we'll get see how far we get into that. And then uh, also because we have a Thursday exam, uh, the next section, which is the respiratory system and urinary system, uh, I want you to do the pre-labs because again, that's one of the weekends to study that material. And so to encourage you to be thinking ahead and not taking a five-day weekend uh, is to have those pre-labs do. So that is the game plan. Any questions on that? All right, we left off last class and we were finishing off the oral cavity uh, proper and all of the accessory structures. I encourage you to look at the teeth uh, and understand that information. And so if there aren't any questions on that, is there any questions on the oral cavity or anything associated with the oral cavity before we march our merry way through the rest of the alimentary canal? All right, if there are no questions, then we will move on into uh, from the oral cavity into the pharynx, the second organ of the alimentary canal. This is one we'll be talking about in the next organ system as well, the respiratory system, because both the respiratory system and the uh, digestive system share this organ. This organ is a pathway for the food and drink. Uh, into the esophagus that, we're, that, that we use, uh, but it is also a pathway for the air, oops, for the air we breathe in uh, to come in to the uh, larynx and into the trachea. So we have uh, three distinct regions to the uh, pharynx. They're all ad identified by the openings they are adjacent to. Uh, the nasopharynx is open to, as you can see here, uh, the posterior part of the nasal cavity. We have talked about that before because that's where our pharyngeal tonsil is located. Uh, notice here uh, the oral pharynx is next to the uh, oral cavity. Uh, notice also they've got the lingual and the palatine tonsils, as well as those arches that we've talked about that are located in this region. The third opening we haven't talked about yet, at least not since 430, is the uh, larynx. Uh, we talked about the larynx briefly in 430 because hopefully you remember uh, the epiglottis is one of the structures we talked about that's made up of that same bendable elastic cartilage that we have in our ear. And its job is actually to close over the airway to help to direct the food into the esophagus. And we'll actually be talking about that swallow reflex in just a second. Uh, so this third part, the laryngopharynx, is open to the opening of that larynx. And so that's where those three get their names. And notice both the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx are both passageways for food and drink and also for air whereas the nasopharynx is only an opening uh, that is um, a pathway, I should say, for air. And so why how, or how do you think these three regions might differ, or more specifically, the nasopharynx might differ from the oro and laryngopharynx uh, anatomically, or maybe even histologically? Would it have, uh, would the nasopharynx have more hairs at the beginning due to uh, like the first line defense compared to like the mouth? What do you mean by hairs? Like to stop uh, like pathogens from entering, like right, right at the beginning of your, uh, of your nasal canal. So absolutely out here in the vestibule, as we'll talk about in the uh, respiratory system, there are some vibrissae, some hairs that are going to limit the movement in. But what about the nasopharynx? Do we have hairs per se in the nasopharynx? No. 
No, but we may have long motile finger-like extensions that may look a little bit like hairs in that region. What might that be? Something that might help to move the mucus of the nasal cavity to the oral cavity so it can be sweat at, spit out or into the esophagus so it can be swallowed. Cilia? Cilia, absolutely. Our nasopharynx is gonna be lined with a ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar epithelial tissue. Just like the nasal cavity as a passageway where only air travels, uh, we want that air to be able to, again, be moistened uh, in that mucus, capturing dust and debris. And then we need to move that mucus, like I said, uh, to this muscular throat so it can either be swallowed or it can be spit out. However, as we learned, those cilia are very delicate. So are we gonna wanna line the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx with a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue? because that hot coffee, that sharp tortilla chip, that acidic wine, those things are gonna be good for cilia? These are the easy questions, folks. No. No. So what type of tissue is the oropharynx and laryngopharynx gonna be lined with? Thank you, Amy. Absolutely, this is going, they are both gonna be lined with a non-keratinized stratified squamous uh, epithelial tissue. Exactly. So again, uh, the pharynx itself is a muscular tube uh, that has these three distinct regions and the nasopharynx is histologically distinct from the other two by the tissue that lines it. When we talked about functions for the um, digestive system, how many of those six functions take place here in the pharynx? Propulsion. Yeah, any others? All right, well, ingestion hopefully doesn't take place here. Right, defecation hopefully doesn't take place here. Is there any chemical or mechanical digestion that is taking place? Any absorption that is taking place here in the pharynx? No. No, so exactly. Basically the pharynx is, as we stated, basically just a muscular tube with one function and one function only, propulsion. Essentially it is a conduit, a passageway. Right, a means to get from one location to another, but it really doesn't do anything to modify the food at all on that journey. Here's another nice illustration that shows these three regions as well, part of this anatomy uh, of the, what we commonly think of as the throat. All right, so as I mentioned, it is just part of the conduit, just part of the passageway uh, of really the goal of getting this food from the oral cavity to the stomach. The esophagus, whose anatomy we haven't talked about yet, is also basically only used for propulsion. Again, there's no absorption or secretion or chemical or mechanical digestion or anything else that happens to the food in the esophagus. So our goal is to get the food uh, from our oral cavity into the stomach. And of course, what do we call that process? Or commonly call that process? Come on, guys, I'm pitching up softballs here. How do you get food out of your mouth? Swallowing. There you go. You swallow. Absolutely. Right. Now, of course, we need to know the appropriate anatomical term for this. I'm not going to ask you for the swallow <laughs> reflex on the exam. I will ask you to describe the process of deglutition. But as we know, anatomists are jerks and deglutition is just a fancy way of saying swallowing. So let's talk about this swallow reflex. It is a complicated reflex over 22 muscles are involved in this process. But luckily for us, it's basically easily broken down into three main phases. 
And those three main phases are primarily identified by where the food is located. So where the food is located is basically how we identify these three distinct phases of deglutition. Of course, phase one is when the food is in the mouth, right? Obviously, uh, you have the voluntary act of ingestion, putting the food into your mouth, but then you also have the voluntary act, well, mostly voluntary act, of presenting the food to the posterior part of the oral cavity to start the swallow reflex. I mentioned partially voluntary because I'm sure everybody has been chewing on a piece of gum or sucking on a hard candy. And as you were moving it around in your mouth, it may have accidentally gone too far to the back of your mouth. Maybe you were about to speak or you were about to talk or, 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 or something like that. And as it went too far back, uh, you accidentally swallowed it. And that is because once it comes in contact with the posterior part of the oral cavity, it triggers a subconscious reflex. What do I mean by that? Something that your body kind of does by itself, but you don't really, you really don't have to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. It is a reflex. So we know it's something that we don't have to think about. Absolutely. That we don't have to do that way. However, if, right? Because Friday night is right around the corner and you and your buddy go to a bar and they have one too many Long Island iced teas and they're passed out on the floor. Should you be pouring a cup of coffee down their throat because they can swallow it and it'll get in their stomach and help wake them up? No, of course not. Don't pour hot coffee down a unconscious person's throat, right? Because if you are not conscious, this reflex does not occur. So if someone is passed out and you pour hot coffee into their mouth, you're going to be pouring that hot coffee into their lungs. And trust me, lungs don't like hot coffee. So yes, this is a reflex that you must actually be conscious for it to take place. So yes, it's not something you voluntarily do, but you do have to be uh, conscious for it to take place. It starts again by where the food, food is located. The food is located in the oral cavity. And when it's located in the oral cavity, we call this the buccal phase. Uh, this is when mastication is occurring, which is another fancy anatomist hatus term for what? Chewing, mm -hmm. excellent, absolutely. We are also producing and mixing uh, the food with saliva. As I mentioned, every bite of food you take, you're supposed to chew 43 times before you swallow it. And after that person yeah, right, takes a bite of your sandwich, chews it 43 times, uh, and then you didn't ask them to take a bite of your sandwich, and you ask for it back, do you really want it back at that point? After someone has undergone no. the buccal phase of this process? No, because it is a process of transformation that takes place. We are transforming that food, right? We are transforming that food from that cheeseburger that it was into a big mashed up pulpy, goopy mix of saliva and food that we call a bolus. Our food basically undergoes different iterations, which basically just means the composition of it changes. And so here in the mouth, food is transformed into a bolus. And so that big goopy mash of food, after you've chewed it the 43 times and you've mixed it in your saliva and you've moved it around with your tongue, it has now become a bolus. And once we have formed that bolus, it is time to move that food out of the oral cavity. To do that, using our tongue, we present that bolus towards the posterior part of the oral cavity. 
When that happens, two things are going to occur. Notice, and again, because of my limited drawing skills, I'm not attempting to try to draw this the way that I normally would, but we can still see what's going on. Notice we talked about before that soft palate that terminates at the uvula. As the uh, bolus is presented to the posterior part of the oral cavity, notice that it pushes the soft palate up. And as it pushes the soft palate up, that closes the opening to the nasopharynx so that the food can't go up into the nasal cavity because food in the nasal cavity is not a whole heck of a lot of fun. But remember, this is a reflex that requires a trigger. And if you remember, we mentioned that there are those two arches in the posterior part of the oral cavity the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal. When the bolus comes in contact with those arches, that stretch of those is what triggers the swallow reflex. So that closes the soft palate, and then as it comes back, it comes in contact with those arches. And once it comes in contact with those arches, our swallow, our deglutition is going to take place and we couldn't stop it if we wanted to. So again, the trigger for this is that contact with the pharyngeal arches. And we can all experience what happens next, right? If you need to grab a drink of water, do that. I'll put something in your mouth, but or just swallow some saliva. Put your hand on your throat and swallow. And what do you notice if you put your hand on your throat and swallow? Come on. What do you notice? Is it that the larynx, I think, like lifts a little bit? Yeah, you feel that bump, what we commonly refer to as the Adam's apple, elevates. And you are absolutely correct. What happens, that trigger of the pharyngeal arches basically causes the larynx to ascend, to elevate. As that larynx elevates, notice that epiglottis, that uh, elastic cartilage structure we talked about, bends over the top of the larynx. The larynx has an opening inside of it known as the glottis. And this epiglottis sits on top of it. And so when it folds over the top, it closes off the opening. So now notice food can't get into the nasal cavity. Food cannot get into our airways. There's only one place for the food to go and that's into the esophagus. But we do have one problem. I'm gonna cheat and go back a picture here. Notice when we go back a picture here, they've got these two arrows on our illustration here showing the very top of the esophagus. As we talked about in the last class, we know that some areas of the circular muscle layer in our digestive pathway can enlarge to become a valve-like structure that can regulate the flow of food. And we called those sphincters. Well, right here, we actually have a sphincter where when you're just doing your normal breathing, uh, no food in your mouth or your food is in your mouth, uh, this a uh, sphincter at the top of the esophagus is closed, and it is known as the upper esophageal sphincter. When that larynx elevates, and now we'll go back to this picture, when the larynx elevates, not only does that cause, cause the closing of the epiglottis, 
But notice it also leads to the opening of that upper esophageal sphincter. So that elevation of the larynx actually does two things. It closes off one opening, making sure that the food doesn't go into the airway, and it opens up the esophagus so that the food can't go into the nasal cavity, can't go into the airway. There is one way and only one way it can go, and that is into the esophagus. I have a question, Professor. Yes. They, you said that the trigger to the second stage would be the, the tactile contact with the pharyngeal arches, not the Correct. first one. So when well, we're describing again, it, we would. So when you're presenting the food to, I, I don't, you can put it, again, it's a continuous process that we're artificially um, breaking, down breaking down. up into steps. So where you want to put the contact with the pharyngeal arches, you know, on which of those you want to do it, uh, is fine. Or make it its own step in the middle, right? Can describe this in six steps instead if you want. Uh, I, I, it's the order that I care about and not necessarily the number of steps. But you have the right idea. When you're presenting it, it is touching those arches and that triggers the reflex, which causes that elevation of the larynx. So if you want to consider it the end of part one, that's fine. If you want to consider it the beginning of part two, it's fine. Because like I said, we're basically artificially dividing this up into steps. So either of those are acceptable ways to think of it. Thank you. All right. Now, notice a couple more things. Clearly, while you're in this pharyngeal phase, your airways are closed. Air can't get into your uh, throat through the nasal cavity because it's closed off and air can't get out of your airway as well. Unless while you're trying to swallow, someone makes you laugh or you try to talk. What happens when that occurs? You start choking? Yeah, you can, absolutely. Because what happens is as you expulse that air, it forces the epiglottis open. And that can either allow the water or the food to get into the uh, airways, or if the force of the air is enough, because you're really laughing, it can cause you to either spit out or it can cause the food. Because notice as the bolus goes down, the uvula is going to descend as well, right? You can get that milk up and out the nose as a result of laughing uh, while someone while you're drinking that glass of milk so absolutely so again if we try to expel expel air during this process that will disrupt this process and again you'll either choke on it because it goes down the wrong pipe or uh, it comes up out your nose as you meant as tiffany mentioned absolutely excellent questions on that all right and as you felt on your throat, after the larynx elevated, the larynx descended as well. And that occurs as the bolus enters into the esophagus and takes us into the esophageal phase. Notice in the esophageal phase, our larynx descends. And those two things that occurred when it ascended, unoccur, or the opposite happens, now our epiglottis opens back up so that our airway is now open and our upper esophageal sphincter closes so the food can't come back out. As I mentioned, without the food there to hold it up against the wall of the pharynx, our uvula is now that dangling thing swinging in the back of your throat once again. So those muscles of the pharynx move the bolus into the esophagus, that upper esophageal sphincter closes, and our bolus is moved via peristalsis oops, into the stomach. And that process takes uh, about seven seconds. 
for the food to go from the esophagus down to the stomach. Notice if we look at the distal end of the esophagus, it, like many of the organs that we're gonna talk about, are bounded by a sphincter at the proximal end and also bounded by, oh, that didn't work at all. Bounded by a sphincter at the distal end. This sphincter at the base of the esophagus where it meets the stomach uh, really has three names associated with it. Gastroesophageal, gastro refers to the stomach. Esophagus obviously refers to the esophageal, uh, the esophageal refers to the esophagus. It is also known as the cardioesophageal sphincter. As we will learn, the um, proximal part of the stomach because of its close proximity to the heart is known as the cardial region. And since the top one is the upper esophageal sphincter, guess what the third name for this sphincter would be? Lower. Yeah, exactly. And again, you may use any of these names in describing this sphincter. So the peristalsis is gonna move this to the stomach, opening up that lower esophageal sphincter and our bolus of food enters into the stomach. And again, I have another pretty picture that does a nice job of showing this. Again, it's all about where the food is. When it's in the mouth, this is the buccal phase. Notice during the buccal phase, our uh, soft palate is down, our epiglottis is up, our larynx is down, and our upper esophageal sphincter is closed. However, when we present the food to the back, it closes the nasal pharynx by pushing that soft palate up against the wall of the pharynx, comes in contact with the arches, uh, the pharyngeal arches in the posterior part of the oral cavity, and it triggers the swallow reflex. And our bolus is moved into the pharynx for the pharyngeal phase. During this phase, as we mentioned, our larynx is elevated. That leads to the folding over of the epiglottis and the opening of the, of the upper esophageal sphincter. And again, our nasal cavity is closed off. Once the food enters, the bolus enters into the esophagus, we reach the esophageal phase, phase, where again, peristalsis moves it down towards the stomach and uh, the oral and throat structures are back where we started. Soft pilot down, epiglottis up, larynx is descended and the upper esophageal sphincter closes. And like I said, about seven seconds after that, the food reaches your stomach. All right, questions on that? This one is the upper esophageal sphincter. It only has one name. The sphincter that has three names is the one of the stomach. And we'll get to that in a second. So when we get to the anatomy of the stomach, we'll hit those again and make sure that we emphasize those. The last thing I wanna talk about uh, though, before we get to the stomach is to briefly talk about the esophagus. Like the pharynx, we know it serves one function and one function only, and that is propulsion. 
It doesn't change the food at all. It doesn't modify or do anything or absorb anything or make any changes. It just moves it from one location to another. However, remember, as we talked about, there is a difference in the histology of our esophagus. Remember when we talked about the basic anatomy of the esophageal sphincter, I mean, of the uh, alimentary canal, we talked about how the posterior, I'm sorry, let's say this this way, inferior or the distal third is different from the superior or proximal, because again, if in, a, in a tube where it enters is the proximal end, where it exits is the distal end. Two thirds are different. What we see over here on the left is a nice cross section through the esophagus. Uh, we can see a couple key characteristics to this. Uh, hopefully one of the first obvious things that sticks out to you is again, we are dealing with smooth muscle and even at a low magnification, hopefully you can distinguish that there is a different orientation to this muscle uh, than there is to this muscle based on its location in relation to the lumen, the one that I've colored yellow, what type of layer would that be? Circular. Circular. And notice in a cross section, you can kind of see how these circular muscle fibers would, oh, I should go back to orange, are kind of traveling around the circumference of this organ. Whereas the longitudinal ones, the ones that would run the length, when we cut through them, we see all the ends because this is all the cross section of it. So we see, oops, sorry, I got a little late, uh, a little messy with that. There we go. Oh, and I should just be doing blue anyway. Here we can see all of the cross sectioned ends of those muscle fibers as they are coming up towards the uh, longitudinal layer that way. However, the other thing that should hopefully stand out, even at a low magnification like this, is as we look at the epithelial tissue. Even at a low magnification, we can clearly see this is not a simple columnar epithelial tissue. And of course, what type of epithelial tissue lines the superior two thirds of the esophagus? Well, what do we find in the mouth? What do we find in the pharynx? Non-keratinized, dreadified squamous. Exactly. And lo and behold, if you look over here to the right, sure enough, you see a non-keratinized, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Many layers of cells with flat cells on the apical surface, and those flat cells on the apical surface have nuclei. They're not filled with keratin, so it is a non-keratinized stratified squamous. However, as Sean pointed out, the inferior or distal third, like most of the alimentary canal, is lined with a simple columnar epithelial tissue. And what I love about this picture here to the right is you can actually see that transition point. And notice it's not gradual. The transition point of where the esophagus switches from a non-keratinized stratified squamous to a simple columnar is very distinct and very abrupt. There's no gradual change in the tissue type. We can very clearly see here where it changes to a simple columnar epithelial tissue. So notice right here, uh, the, their picture is a little bit off. As we mentioned, it should be about a third of the way down. We should, so is where we should see that transition area that we're seeing here. Professor? Yes. Just to clarify, so the steps of the cell will be inside the mouth, non-keratinized, then it will turn into ciliated pseudostratified. Mm -mm. Simple columnar. Those things that you're seeing on the top would be cilia. 
I mean, would be microvilli. So there is going to be some microvilli that you may see on the surface of these. But no, this is a simple columnar. Remember, ciliated pseudostratified is just for the airways. This is deep in the esophagus. This is not some place where we want cilia. What about the pharynx? Didn't we say pharynx headed? Yes, in the nasopharynx. Should food or drink ever go through the nasopharynx? No. No. Okay. Yeah, in fact, if you remember, if we think of the entire alimentary canal, basically the two ends that are open to the outside world, we have a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, right? We have that at the two ends because they need to be protected from the outside world, right? This needs to be protected from... Um, hot coffee, acidic wines, sharp tortilla chips. This end needs to be protected from uh, the uh, vigors of defecation and any other kind of kinky things you may be doing. Uh, and in between, all of the stuff in between is simple columnar. So there's really only two types of epithelial tissues uh, that form the mucous membrane of our digestive system. At the two ends, it's a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, and everything in between is simple columnar. So the stomach is also simple columnar? Yep, stomach. So the distal third of the esophagus, the stomach, uh, the small intestine, and the large intestine, basically up to the rectum. Professor? Yep. Um, on the superior two thirds, um, I think that that would be the submucosa. Um, it, those like that white space, is that literally just like a, like just space or is that just connective tissue? Yeah, I understand. What you, a great question. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. That is another important thing that uh, we got sidetracked by the tissues. Absolutely. Uh, hold on. Let me move this over here and continue. You are absolutely correct. Uh, again, like we expect, there is indeed a submucosa deep to the mucosa. So this is that a real art connective tissue that is deep to it. Right. Sorry, it's not a submucosa, but it is part of the mucous membrane. This is the lamina propria. This is the real art connective tissue that forms the lamina propria. I was just started paying attention to what I was saying. So we have a real art connective tissue, but this is the lamina propria. And you are correct. Notice there are big folds in this because this is a muscular tube. Do we necessarily want our esophagus open all the time? No. No, just when food is passing through it. So basically it's a collapsible muscular tube. Well, notice when we get to the airways, the airways are supported by cartilage, hyaline cartilage to keep them open, to maintain them open, because you know we have much more use of those all the time. Whereas our food pathways are muscular tubes that when not being used, typically are gonna collapse. And so that's what we see here. All right, like I said, that's pretty much it for the esophagus. Again, the esophagus is just a pathway for getting to our next major organ, which is here, which is the stomach. We talked a little bit about this anatomy already, but I definitely absolutely positively want to talk some more about it. For starters, remember we talked about how it has a concave surface known as the lesser curvature. And remember that is where the lesser omentum connects it to the liver. There is also a convex surface, which is the greater curvature where the greater omentum connects to it. The stomach itself is divided up into four regions. As I mentioned, uh, the portion that is closest, the proximal portion, which happens to be closest to the heart, is known as the cardial region or the cardia. We have this big, huge, enlarged pouch structure, which is the fundus. 
we have this funnel-like region, and this funnel-like region is known as the pyloric region or pylorus. And then the fourth part, the part in between, is the body. Lastly, in a theme that we already mentioned with the esophagus, and we will continue to uh, talk about, most of these organs of the alimentary canal are bounded by sphincters, valves that regulate their control at both ends. At the distal end, it is a very large, very thick, very muscular valve known as the pyloric sphincter. And to answer, I don't remember who, Adina's question from way before, remember up here at the proximal end, we have a valve as well. And as we mentioned, there are basically three names and any of these three names are acceptable. And remember those three names were either the lower esophageal, which is again, makes sense because we had the upper esophageal. And so that would be perfectly fine because it is the joint between the esophagus and the cardial region of the stomach. It's also sometimes referred to as the cardioesophageal. Or because the other term, one of the terms commonly associated with the stomach is gastro, it is also referred to as the gastroesophageal. So again, any of those three would be fine for identifying it. I don't care which of those three you use. All right. Now, there are a couple other specializations that we can see from this illustration of the gross anatomy of the stomach. The first that hopefully stands out very prominently is that unlike what we said will commonly occur, here the muscularis externa has not one, not two like we expect, but actually three distinct layers. As expected, we have a circular layer that goes around the circumference of the organ changing its diameter. It is closer to the lumen than the longitudinal layer that runs the length of the organ. But notice deep to both of those, closest to the lumen, is a third layer that is actually at an angle. And because it's at an angle, we call it the oblique layer. As we know, longitudinal layers shorten, change the length of the organ. Circular, change the diameter of the organ. And an oblique one would basically twist the organ. This third layer gives the stomach a tremendous amount of motility. Why might the stomach need increased motility? Mechanical digestion? Yeah, absolutely. Remember, as I mentioned, I know every single person in this class chews their food the 51 times you're supposed to chew it before you swallow it down. But as I mentioned, some people will take a huge honking bite of something, chew it twice, and then down the gullet it goes. So we can continue that process of mechanically breaking down that food here in the stomach. Useful, not vital, but useful, All right? The stomach definitely has the rock star status. You randomly grab somebody on the street and threaten to kill them unless they named an organ in the digestive system. Most people would say stomach. Trust me, I know I've tried. Right. And while it has that uh, rock star status, as we'll learn, it's not really warranted. As we'll learn, it is definitely a useful organ that has its functions. But you would also happily survive without a stomach. 
except for one thing. There's only one thing your stomach does that is vital for your existence. And it's not what you think it is. But we'll get to its functions in a minute. Let's talk about the other big specialization that we see here. Notice as we look on the inside, there are all these folds. These folds are what are known as the rugae. And one of the important things to uh, emphasize about these rugae are these are rugae that are folds in the mucosa and submucosa. Nope, that did not write at all. Where'd that go? Oh, I put that in the window. Cheat. Copy that. So these are folds in both the mucosa and the submucosa. And I believe, although I've made a mess of this picture, I have, uh, so I guess I have to clear my images to show this. Here is a nice low magnification view of a portion of the stomach. Let's take some time to digest what we are clearly seeing here. Here we see the muscularis. Nice, big, thick, muscular layer. Now, at this magnification, is it easy to see the three distinct layers that must be here? I'm not seeing it. Maybe you have better eyes than I do, but I'm not really seeing it. But we know there have to be three layers there. But what we're seeing above this here are these big folds in the wall of the stomach. Notice if we look really closely like you should be doing, we can see that here is the mucosa and the submucosa, uh, pardon me, the mucosa, let me try that again. Here are the simple columnar cells and the areolar connective tissue that is the lamina propria. How do I know the lamina propria was in there? Because notice there's this thin pink line here. What is this thin pink line that I'm drawing here? The areolar connective tissue. Not a bad guess, but no, but it's pink. Notice a pretty dark pink, kind of similar to what I'm seeing down here. Oh, the um, muscularis. Uh, oh, Lord. <laughs> the mucosa mus muscularis. There you muscle. go, exactly. The muscularis mucosa. Remember the muscularis mucosa is the base of the mucous membrane of the mucosa. So these three layers, the simple columnar, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa make up the mucosa. And so notice that means that all of this, well, that color doesn't show up well at all. Uh, let's do that and that. All of this in here is the areolar connective tissue that is the submucosa. So notice these rugae are folds in both the mucosa and the submucosa. I make a point of emphasizing it because you can only barely see it at this low magnification. But as we're gonna see, there are these gastric pits and gastric glands of the stomach. And these gastric pits and gastric glands are just in the mucosa. So just in the mucosa, we have these deep invaginations with some specialized cells that are important for the function of the stomach. Something in that a high magnification will be able to see much more clearly. So that's why the mucosa is so thick and, uh, and, and convoluted in its shape because we have these gastric glands in here. But notice the rugae are these big massive folds that we can see at a very low magnification and are made up of both the uh, mucosa and submucosa. And then of course, what's the fourth layer? Out here? Serosa. Serosa, exactly, because this is an intraperitoneal organ. So it is lined with a serosa. And remind me again of the epithelial tissue and connective tissues that make that serosa. Well, at least give me the epithelial tissue. Mesothelium. True, that is its name based on its location, but what tissue type is it? Simple there you go. 
Simple squamous, absolutely. And at this magnification, are we going to be able to see a simple squamous epithelial tissue and the little bit of a real art connective tissue that holds it in place? Probably not. No, probably not. So yeah, I can't even really see. I mean, I know this is lined with simple columnar cells, but I can't even really see the columnar cells. I'm definitely not seeing a simple squamous, but we know it's there. Uh, sorry, Professor, where's the rugae again? This fold, this right here is a rugae. This here, this big, huge fold that is made up of the mucosa and the submucosa, right? So notice here is another one. We have these three rugae, four, another one coming up over here, that if we go back to the previous picture, which I think I have here, nope, which I have here, are these folds that we have in the stomach. And why do we have these folds in the stomach? Increased surface area. Okay, not a bad guess. That would be one reason why we might want it, but uh, not necessarily in this place. Increased surface area is useful for what? Absorption. And is there a lot of absorption that takes place in the stomach? No. No, there's going to be some, but uh, not a lot. There you go. Hand has hit it on the head. The stomach can expand, right? We're a little farther away from uh, the 4th of July, so it's harder for me to use that example, right? The greatest sporting event in the history of all mankind. But let's instead look forward, right? Thanksgiving is right around the corner. And assuming you and all of your loved ones have been properly vaccinated and gotten your boosters and all of those kind of things, um, you're encouraged to get together with your family and eat massive quantities of food. Right, you want to have that fourth serving of grandma's stuffing, and that sort of that third slice of Aunt Hildy's pie. Right, your stomach, when it's empty, is a, about the size and shape of your two hands together. Is that enough space to put three pieces of pie and four servings of stuffing, and the cranberry sauce, and the turkey, and the gravy, and the mashed potatoes, and the appetizers, and all the other things? Maybe if I uh, chew eighty-five times. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe if I chew 85 times. <laughs> exactly. No, but even then, right? So obviously we need that ability to be able to expand, that massive expansion, right? As I was talking about the hot dog eating contest that happens on the 4th of July every year. When you look at these competitive eaters, one of the things these competitive eaters will do is they will drink an entire gallon of water in a single sitting. Is it because they're really, really thirsty? I'm not talking about during the event. I'm talking about in training for the event. Do they drink that whole gallon of water because they're thirsty? No. No, exactly. Alice got it. They're taking, they're drinking a whole gallon of water in one sitting because it stretches out their stomach. They're stretching out their stomach to make room for the food when they're eating those, uh, those they're competing in those contests. All right. Questions on the gross anatomy of the stomach. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the more microscopic anatomy. Remember, as I mentioned and I showed you, and let's, again, I wanna emphasize what we're looking at now. This picture that I just showed you basically is this right here. It is the top of one of these rugae. And it is just the mucous membrane, just the mucosa. So if we took that, we take this box and we blow it up and look at it, what it's going to look like is this right here. Notice here is our muscularis mucosa, something that is very important to always identify because it easily helps us to distinguish the mucosa, which is always, it's a part of and everything above that, and the submucosa, which is the real art connective tissue beneath it. Notice this actually shows a cross section through the entire stomach. So notice we have the one, two, three layers of smooth muscle at different orientations. Remember, oblique is closest to the lumen, then circular and longitudinal. 
And notice they've even given us our simple squamous and our real, our connective tissue, our serosa on the bottom. But what I care about right now is actually what's going on in this mucosa. Here in the mucosa, notice we have our simple columnar cells that line the surface of the stomach. But then the simple columnar epithelial cells penetrate deep down into the mucosa, forming these big, large structures known as the gastric glands. And the openings up here at the top, this funnel-like opening that we see here at the top is known as the gastric pits. All right, so if we were to look at the stomach from inside the lumen, what we would basically see as we look down at it is we would see all of these openings that would be the gastric pits, all right? We would see this opening right here that is the gastric pit, and then down deep below it would be the gastric gland. And here, notice they've done a nice job of emphasizing this over here. The gastric gland, or happening gastric pit, is the uh, superior part, the proximal part closest to the lumen. And then deep to that are all the specialized cells that form the gastric gland. And what do you think this gastric gland produces? Hydrochloric acid? Part of it, yeah. Or, and all the other stuff that we collectively call the gastric juice. So the goal of the gastric gland is to produce the gastric juice. All right, notice one last thing. We'll take a closer look at this in just a second, but I want to emphasize it here. We have the cells that line the surface of the stomach and line the gastric pits. That is one type of cell, but the gastric gland itself contains actually four distinct, different, unique cells with their own different distinct functions. So technically there are a total of five different cells that are serving functions here in the stomach. The first ones are the ones that line the stomach and line the gastric pits. And here we see that as well. Oh, this is even better than the one that I was drawing. Again, notice we have the gastric pits that we see on the surface of the mucosa lined by the same cells that line the surface of the stomach in our gastric pits. And then deep to that, we have the specialized cells of the gastric glands. So let's talk about these five different types of cells and discuss what they do. And here's a pretty picture that shows all five of them. The superficial cells, the ones that line the surface and line the gastric pits are cells we've talked about before. Goblet cells. What do goblet cells do? Come on, these are the easy questions. We get through these cells, we can take our first break. You can get more caffeine and be more alert. What do goblet cells do? Produce mucus. <laughs> Exactly, they produce mucus, absolutely. They produce mucin, remember mucin is the protein. But when that mucin is released, it hydrates and when it hydrates, it produces mucus. And here in the stomach, it produces a very thick, a very sticky and a very alkaline mucus. Why would we want something like that? Uh, maybe like instead of the stomach acid to combat it yeah exactly we know as you guys a couple of people have already mentioned we are going to fill this stomach with hydrochloric acid and it's going to have a ph of between one and two and do cells typically like being in an environment where the ph is one or two 
No. No. So if we can cover these cells and protect these cells with a thick layer of a very sticky, so it stays on the cells, and very alkaline so that it helps to neutralize the acidity of any acid that tries to get to the cells, it can provide some protection, this nice thick protective coating for the cells. Because what happens if your goblet cells underproduce mucus, or maybe because of your diet or because of stress, you're overproducing hydrochloric acid, what can potentially happen to your stomach then? There you go, Amy hit it on the head, ulcers. Exactly, ulcers are basically when that acid starts to eat away at the columnar cells on the surface. And if, that, uh, if those ulcers go deep enough, they can affect the large blood vessels and you can get bleeding ulcers, which are very, very bad. Absolutely, yes. Um, I've heard that for some people, if they eat a ton of spicy food, they could get like stomach ulcers. Is, does that have to do with how the mucus works or the acid? Uh, as we've talked about, uh, spicy food does act as an irritant. Mm -hmm. So there is a potential, uh, both not only in the oral cavity, but also in the esophagus and in the stomach where that capsaicin can irritate the tissues. That irritation can lead to uh, a, an increase in acid production, which can lead to that. So it, it potentially can, mm -hmm. but this is again, one of those things where I think uh, people's lifestyles and people's genetics affect that. If you've grown up eating it, then probably you're uh, probably more likely to produce more of these, or these goblet cells are maybe more active to help to uh, produce more acid and I mean more uh, mucus to provide more protection from those things. Uh, and genetically, some people probably are more likely to be irritated by spicy foods and other people are less just for, you know, genetic variations. Some people may produce mm. less sticky or less alkaline, you know, mucus or may produce less overall or, or, or thinner amounts of it or something like that. So, so it's, there can be a correlation, but it doesn't mean that if everybody eats the same amount of the same spicy food, they're all going to have the same amount of damage to their lining of their stomach. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Excellent. All right. So again, these goblet cells are the ones that line the surface and line the gastric pit. They are not part of the gastric gland, right? The, they are separate. They are in the stomach, vitally important, but they're not part of the cells that help to um, produce the gastric juice. Instead, the gastric juice, which again, and I've said this last time also with Slive, I'll say the same thing here, on average, your stomach produces about a liter and a half of gastric juice a day, but that is strongly dependent on the composition of the food, the volume of the food, and the amount of times you eat during the course of the day. So again, this can vary dramatically from person to person, but this is a good average number. And there are basically three and a half cells that are responsible for producing the gastric juice. Obviously, the one we've been talking about the most is our parietal cells. Parietal cells, uh, they're very distinct cells. As you can see, these parietal cells kind of have this pitchfork type of appearance. They're kind of triangular with these big, huge invaginations in them. It makes them a very distinct cell that is easy to identify. And these are the ones that produce the hydrochloric acid. Now, we've talked about this sort of, but let's make sure we understand all of the implications. Why? What is it that this hydrochloric acid does for us? Does it activate pepsin pepsinogen? Okay, absolutely. It's going to activate not just a pepsin, but also other enzymes. Oops, activates. 
Remember, we talked about that lingual lip base, which is inactive uh, in the mouth, but when we swallow it down, it becomes active. And remind me again why it activates those enzymes. What does the change in pH? Obviously, it changes the pH. Why does that activate these particular enzymes? What does pH do? Denatures protein. Well, it changes the shape of proteins. Absolutely. You have the right idea. So in the case of activating the proteins, it is changing them from an inactive state to an active state. However, you've also hit the other key function on this as well. What about the proteins in that cheeseburger you ate for breakfast? Is it changing the shapes of those as well? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. That helps to unwind the proteins. What of our six functions of the digestive system would that fall under? Chemical digestion. Say that again. Chemical digestion. Chemical. Chemical digestion is where you break bonds. Are you breaking bonds when you're denaturing the protein? No, you're just unfolding it. Yeah, you're unfolding it. You're making it easier for the enzymes to get in there and break the bonds. But technically, this denaturing doesn't break bonds. So it's actually part of the mechanical digestion. Now, is this part of the mechanical digestion of all of the foods we eat? No, just proteins. Can we denature carbohydrates? Can we denature lipids? Save you the trouble. No, this only works as a mechanical digestion for proteins. Excellent. Does this acid do anything else? Well, I'm asking the question. So clearly the answer is yes. Professor, I had a question about um, how hydrochloric acid affects the, or activates enzymes. Does it specifically target their uh, substrates or? So remember, if you think back to 430, when we talked about proteins, proteins basically have four layers of organization to their structure. Obviously the primary is just which amino acids you put in a row. However, as we know, each of those amino acids have a functional group that comes off of it. And some of those functional groups are gonna be positive. Maybe the functional group of another one would be negative. And so those two uh, functional groups would be drawn towards each other. And that would cause a tiny bend in my sequence of amino acids. And these hydrogen bonds that form between the functional groups form our secondary structures. Things like the alpha helixes and the beta sheets. When you put all of the secondary structures of a single a sequence of amino acids together, it has a three-dimensional shape. And then remember, most proteins are made up of multiple uh, subunits put together, and that was the quaternary shape. So notice the shape and therefore the function of a protein is ultimately determined by these hydrogen bonds that form between the functional groups. And when we change the pH, that modifies those functional groups or modifies the hydrogen bonds between those functional groups. And so it changes the shape. Remember, we had a fancy word for it. It undergoes a conformational change. In this case, that conformational change is simply because that pH changes the hydrogen bonds or effects. And because it affects the hydrogen bonds, it changes the shape of the protein.
in some cases, like that enzyme, that change in shape is a positive thing because it's now becoming functional. However, that protein in the cheeseburger, right? Changing its shape just opens it up, making it easier for the enzymes to get in there and do their work. So the hydrochloric acid doesn't actually break any of those covalent bonds that are holding the things together. It's just spreading apart those, those hydrogen bonds that give changing the hydrogen bonds to change the shape of the protein. Got it. Thanks. Excellent. Yep. So think back to the last section of the class. What else does hydrochloric acid do for us? There we go. Protection from pathogens. There you go. Perfect. Exactly. Part of our first line of, de of defense. Excellent. That was what I was looking for. Spectacular. Like I said, useful, important, but not vital for our existence. Right? As, as helpful as these things are, they're not vital for our existence. However, remember, I did say that there was one thing that the stomach did that was vital for our existence. And it's actually this parietal cell that does it. This parietal cell produces a chemical, hormone-like chemical. It's not a hormone, but it is a chemical that kind of works like a hormone. And basically its job is to tell the large intestine to absorb vitamin B12. Where does vitamin B12 come from? Meat. Yeah, meat, eggs, dairy, things along those lines. You can eat a whole cow's worth of meat, but if you don't have that intrinsic factor in your digestive system, then you will not be able to absorb the B12 from it. And does anybody happen to know what B12 is used for? Is it to synthesize blood erythrocytes? Yeah. Exactly. We use it to make erythrocytes. We need vitamin B12 to make red blood cells. And how important is it for us to make red blood cells? Very. Very vitally important. Remember, as we talked about, red blood cells only last for about 100 to 120 days. We have millions of them dying every day and we need to be able to produce millions more. If someone has severe stomach ulcers or severe stomach cancer, they can actually surgically remove the stomach, basically connect the esophagus straight to the small intestine. And the person would survive. Their lifestyle would change slightly. We'll talk about some of the functions that the stomach does, but we could survive. However, the one, per the one thing that person is then doing for the rest of their lives is they're getting B12 injections. Because without these parietal cells, they're not gonna be able to absorb B12 from their food anymore. So instead they're gonna have to get it with an injection into their body so that we can give it to them directly that way. So this production of B12, allowing us to absorb, uh, this, pardon me, this production of intrinsic factor, which allows us to absorb vitamin B12 in our large intestine is the only thing the stomach does that is vital for our survival. It's definitely useful. It helps a lot, but this is the only thing it does that's vital. All right, questions on that? All right, let's talk about our other two and a half cells that make the gastric glands. The next one are our chief cells. Chief cells produce an inactive protein, pardon me, an inactive enzyme called pepsinogen. Anyone know what pepsinogen becomes? Pepsin. Pepsin when active. And that's the thing that you can drink instead of Coke, right? 
No, uh, not really. <laughs> what is pepsin? What does it do? It's an enzyme. Enzyme Break that breaks down. Proteins. Exactly. You can kind of see why you'd want to make it in an inactive form. If you were a cell that is absolutely chock filled with proteins inside of you, do you necessarily want to be making an enzyme that can be breaking down those ends? I mean, those proteins inside of you? No. No. So you want to make it in an inactive form, release it from the body. I mean, release it from the cell. And then when it's released from the cell, it can be activated by the hydrochloric acid. It can be activated by the other pepsins that are in there. And it can break down the proteins in your cheeseburger and not the proteins inside your cell. And you guys hit on this. I think I also, oh, there's one other thing too. Um, in infants, chief cells also produce two more enzymes, a gastric lipase. What do lipases break down again? That's fats, absolutely. And also an enzyme called renin. Renin happens to break down milk sugars. So here we have a, a enzyme that breaks down milk sugars. We have one that could break down, say, fats in a milk. Why might these be useful in an infant? Breast milk. Exactly, because that's what their diet consists of. Their diet consists of milk. Notice as we age, the chief cells stop making these hormones. So one of the things that occurs with everybody to some extent, some more than others, is we all become a little bit more lactose intolerant as we age. Our ability to break down those milk sugars and those milk fats decrease as we age. And so we all become a little bit more lactose intolerant as we age. As I mentioned, I've got a pretty picture here that shows this. As we talked about, we're releasing that pepsinogen in its inactive form. As uh, someone mentioned earlier, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I don't remember who said it, hydrochloric acid will activate that pepsinogen into pepsin. And then of course, pepsin being an enzyme that breaks down proteins can actually enhance pepsinogen activation. So by breaking down, biting off the inactive piece, it activates the pepsinogen into more pepsin. So we got kind of a positive feedback process the more pepsinogen we get, the more pepsin we'll get as a result of this. And the more proteins we'll be able to break down. Now, if we go back to our gastric gland, here in our gastric, gastric gland, these chief cells and parietal cells are the majority of the cells we find in the middle of our gastric gland. However, there are two additional cells that are found in here as well. The first is located up here at the proximal end of the gastric gland, and that is our mucus neck cell. That mucus neck cell, as its name is, indicates, produces mucus. But what's interesting about this mucus is that the mucus it produces is actually acidic. The function for this is not completely understood. Again, it seems kind of counterintuitive to make an acidic mucus. But what is theorized, the two most common beliefs of what this might be helping with is by having an acidic mucus here, it helps to keep the gastric pit from becoming congested, right? If you think about it, if you got a big, huge clump of mucus that blocked off the opening, then all that hydrochloric acid and all those enzymes would be breaking down our gastric cells and our gastric gland, and we don't want that. So hopefully this acidic uh, mucus can help to uh, maintain the opening that is the gastric pit. And being acidic, it may also help to activate the pepsin. So it probably helps to keep the gastric pit open, likely helps to uh, activate the pepsin. But like I said, its full function isn't fully understood. 
And that secretion, again, is part of that gastric juice. However, notice there is one final cell. This final cell is located deep at the base of these gastric glands. And this deep cell happens to be commonly referred to as a G cell, and you may use the term G cell. And this G cell is an enteroendocrine cell. What did we say the enteroendocrine cells were? What's that a fancy way of saying? It secretes to itself? Close. Remember, an enteroendocrine cell is a one-celled endocrine gland. So this is a cell that produces hormones. This cell is called a G cell because the hormone it produces is the hormone gastrin. Gastrin is a strong excitatory Uh, hormone. We will talk about many of the functions of it, but in this case, while we're here in the stomach, it both increases gastric gland activity and stomach motility. So it makes the stomach churn up the food more and it makes the stomach produce more gastric juice. Now notice when I mentioned the production of our gastric juice, I did say three and a half cells because let's talk about these enteroendocrine cells because they're endocrine cells way down here at the base of the uh, gastric gland. Is their job going to be to produce that gastrin and release it into the lumen and release it out into the lumen of the stomach? No. No, right? Remember, um, our endocrine glands don't release outside the body. They don't release into the ducts. Where they release is into the interstitial fluid, which then gets into the blood supply. So these are actually releasing their hormones into the capillaries, into the blood supply. So they don't directly produce part of the gastric juice, but they do enhance gastric juice production. So what they're making doesn't go into the stomach, but they stimulate the rest of the cells to make more. And are all these cells uh, stimulated by stretch receptors in the stomach or? Yes, so stretch receptors will stimulate these, and now we know also hormonally they can be stimulated by things like gastrin. Yeah, so think about it. And we're actually, that's it's a great point that you just made because that's literally exactly where we're going to go next. All right, we'll come back to this in a second. We'll look at all this in a second. Um, actually, I lied. I guess we do have a little bit more to talk about. There we go. We need to, after the break, talk about the regulation of gastric activity. So we're going to talk about gastric activity and how these things relate and how they're stimulated and how we control the stomach. So absolutely, we're going to talk about that. All right. So those are the five epithelial cells of our stomach. Remember the uh, goblet cells line the surface, line the gastric pits, are not part of the gastric glands, do not produce part of the gastric juice. They produce the thick, sticky, alkaline substance. Uh, the 
mucus neck cells, the parietal cells, the chief cells produce collectively what we call the gastric juice, whereas our enteroendocrine cell, the G cell, releases hormones into the interstitial fluid, which can enhance the production of our gastric juice. Now, notice on a pretty illustration like this, we can clearly see the enteroendocrine cells, right? We have this nice distinct shape of the parietal cells. So let's look at the actual histology. Here's a nice high magnification view. Anyone able to see one of those you know, fork shaped parietal cells? I can see two in all of this. Anybody else having any success? Probably not, all right? So do you think that that's something that I'm gonna make you do histologically? Am I going to point at a cell in here and say, identify this cell, what is its function? No. Probably, I'm <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I'm not a jerk, right? So no, <laughs> absolutely not. However, again, we could do a little bit of this. I, I could, for instance, right, identify this cell and its function. Should we be able to do that? Yeah. Yeah, because that's that goblet cell, right? And notice also, Whereas we can't tell much about the gastric glands, it's pretty easy to sell where the gastric pits are and where they stop and where the gastric glands begin. So notice we can pretty easily see the border of the pits up here with their goblet cells and the more specialized cells of the glands there. So that's something that I should be able to expect you to be able to do histologically, tell the difference between the pit and the gland. But no, I'm not going to hold you responsible for uh, being able to distinguish these cells histologically. All right. Here's some more. Again, we can see uh, the pits a little bit nicer here. And then again, the beginning of the glands down here. This is a picture I wanted to show because this does a really nice job of showing us most of what we've been talking about. Notice the one thing we're really not seeing too much of, although it's probably a little bit of one here. We, this may be, because notice this enlargement of the submucosa, uh, that might be a small rugae or the beginning of a rugae that we're starting to see there. But notice at this magnification, we're really not seeing much of the rugae, but we can clearly see all of the other regions, the four regions of this tissue. We can clearly see the mucosa, Again, we want to find that mucosa, mus uh, muscularis mucosa, to identify that boundary of that, that tiny little thin piece of smooth, mus of, uh, yeah, smooth muscle. Here we can, again, see the gastric pits and the gastric glands that are going to be here. This area here is clearly the submucosa, that real art connective tissue uh, that is not a part of the mucous membrane. And notice here, we can also very clearly see R1, R2, and R3 layers of smooth muscle. And I'll label them one, two, and three. Smooth muscle layer one, which layer is that? Oblique. Excellent. And two is? Circular. Circular. And three is? Longitudinal. There you go. And we know that because of their relationship to the lumen. Last thing I wanted to show you, because I think this is really cool. This is actually a, um, a rat's uh, alimentary canal. I make a point of emphasizing this because uh, as you can see, this over here, let's orient ourselves. This over here is the esophagus. And then this is the pyloric, uh, pardon me, uh, sorry, not the esophagus. This over here is the small intestine, sorry.
Anyway, I, oh, screw it. You know what I'm saying? I definitely obviously need coffee. What I wanted to show you here that I think is really cool is as we see, we have these two layers. We have our longitudinal layer and we have our circular layer of the muscle. But notice that in the stomach, in the pyloric region, which we'll talk about its function a little bit more in just a minute, there is this big, huge, thick layer of muscle because it's a very muscular tube. But even with as thick as the circular layer is, notice there is a big, huge enlargement of that circular layer, forming that valve that is going to control the movement of uh, fluid from the stomach to the small intestine. That pyloric sphincter is a valve. And that valve really is a big, huge enlargement of that circular layer. So here we see how that circular layer can enlarge to form that valve uh, that we will use to move substances from one part of our alimentary canal to the next. All right, questions on any of the gross or microscopic anatomy of the stomach? We are gonna talk about the physiology in a minute and we'll emphasize it more there, but I'll go ahead now that we've talked about the gland, I do wanna come back here uh, to emphasize two things. The one thing we didn't see, but you are responsible for histologically. So I will emphasize that here, is there is a difference in the different regions of the stomach. As I just mentioned, the pyloric sphincter uh, the, pardon me, the pyloric region, this funnel, has the thickest muscle layer because it's really about churning the food and forcing that food into the small intestine. This is also where obviously the most mechanical digestion takes place. But also the least chemical. So in this case, the gastric glands here in the pyloric region have many more mucus glands in them, much, much more mucus glands in them in this region, as opposed to like, for instance, the body or the fundus over here. And there are differences between the body and the fundus, but they're a little bit more subtle, so we won't worry about them. So we'll just collectively throw them together. In the body, in the fundus, the uh, smooth muscle layers are much thinner. But we also, in our gastric glands, have many more of the, of the chief and parietal cells. Because here, more of the uh, mechanical apart more of the chemical digestion is taking place. So we need those enzymes, we need that. And that is something that can be seen as we look at this thing histologically. All right. So notice this very thick, a lot of goblet cells. This would be what the pyloric area looks like. And again, this would also be pyloric with much, much thicker muscle layer to it. Whereas if we go back to that first picture, even though it was a lower magnification, it's a thinner layer of smooth muscle and notice how much darker the pits are because there's less mucus producing going on here, more parietal and more chief cells, more gastric juice producing in this area. So those are some differences you need to be able to uh, be somewhat comfortable with. Uh, these are definitely pictures that I could use, but again, remember, my goal for you is not to memorize this picture. My goal for you is to understand this material. So would I show you a similar picture to this that I found on the almighty Google as long as I believed it to be an obvious example? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so yes. So uh, again, you have these. Some of these are from your textbook. Some of these are from your lab manual. Some of these are from your histology atlas. 
but some of these pictures are just pictures I found on the almighty Google. And that's exactly what I do when I'm putting the exam together. Sometimes I use the pictures from lecture. Sometimes I picture, use the pictures from your textbook and from your lab manual and from Google. And, you know, I mean, and from your histology atlas, but sometimes I just do a search on Google and find a good example of something and use it there. Because again, the goal isn't to memorize these 30 pictures. The goal is to understand the material. All right. And once you understand the material, it doesn't matter how what I show you. As long as it's an obvious example of something, then you should be able to interpret it. All right. Oh, I went way long. Sorry about that. No wonder you guys got all quiet on me. Not that you were chatty to begin with, but all right, here's your goal. Go caffeinate so that you, when you come back, you will be chatty. Let's go ahead and take our first break. It looks like it's 140 now. So we will come back at 155 and we will restart and uh, I will um, start the recording at that time. And I'm going to go get coffee. So uh, make sure you're caffeinated as well, because if I'm caffeinated and you're not, you're going to be in trouble. Oh, oh uh, you didn't need to know that that was a rat. I'm just telling you that it's a rat. Ours looks similar. Ours is just going to be larger, so it's harder to get it on a microscope slide where you could see it all at once. That's often the advantage of using some of these comparative models is that because they're smaller, you can get the whole thing on the slide and be able to see the whole thing on the slide, right? If your stomach's the size of your two fists together, Right, that pyloric sphincter on that is going to be really hard to get on one microscopic slide that we can see on an image. So that's the advantage of using comparative anatomy, is because most of the things that we use to compare are smaller, so we can see them at that scale. All right, great question. Any others? All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. We are recording. We've gotten through the anatomy of the stomach. So let's talk a little bit about the physiology of it. Remember we were talking about how the composition of our food changes. After you've chewed it up and mixed it with your saliva, our food has become bolus. And obviously if you spit that out, it would look very different than the cheeseburger than it went in. But the same thing is true for once you swallow it down into the stomach. In the stomach, it mixes with the gastric juice. So again, if you think about it, if it then were to come back up, uh, it has changed dramatically again. And so when we mix that bolus with the gastric juice, we form a composition, a substance that we call chyme. So chyme is basically our, sec our third iteration of food from food to bolus in this mouth and then to chyme in the stomach. As I mentioned, the stomach does a lot to assist in the function of the digestive system. Uh, with that third layer of smooth muscle, it is able to have tremendous motility. So it is gonna produce these wave-like uh, contractions through it that are going to continue the mechanical digestion just in case you didn't chew your, your food the 67 times you were supposed to before you swallowed it. As we also talked about, we have the release of the hydrochloric acid, which again, remember the hydrochloric acid helps to mechanically <clears throat> digest uh, the proteins. And as we also talked about, uh, both the uh, lingual lipase and if you're an infant, the uh, gastric lipase that is produced will help with the chemical digestion. So if you think about it, when we're thinking of our macromolecules, where did the breakdown of our carbohydrates begin? Salivary amylase. Yeah, and so that started in the mouth with the, with the salivary amylase. Whereas now for the lipids and for the proteins, uh, both of their um, chemical breakdown starts in the stomach. Now, again, this breakdown by the lingual lipase in the stomach of our lipids is very limited. As I believe someone mentioned in the last class, we need to emulsify those fats to break them down more efficiently. And that's gonna occur in the small intestine. But technically it does a little bit begin here in the stomach and obviously in, in and, and, you know, majorly the proteins start in the stomach with that pepsin <clears throat> and the help of that hydrochloric acid. So 
Absolutely. We've talked about these uh, places where we're starting the breakdown of our macromolecules. There's only one more macromolecule left. What's the other macromolecule, the fourth one? Come on, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and... Nucleic acid? Nucleic acids. Uh, the breakdown of that won't start until we get to the small intestine. Excellent. So we did that, we did that, we did that. And of course, we did that as well. So questions on this. All right, excellent. As I mentioned earlier, there is a limited amount of absorption that happens in the stomach, again, in the lining in those mucus cells. Um, and again, that kind of makes sense. If you've got a big, huge, thick layer of thick, sticky, alkaline mucus sitting on top of you, is it going to be easy for nutrients or other materials to get to you to be absorbed? No. No. So there is some very limited absorption that can take place. Uh, water, very interestingly, cold water actually gets absorbed more rapidly than hot, I mean, than room temperature or warm water. So uh, after that a hard workout, it is important to have a nice big glass of ice water because that can uh, uh, be absorbed more rapidly. <clears throat> uh, certain electrolytes, uh, some short chain fatty acids and things that are lipid soluble like alcohol, right? It's one of the reasons why when you have those four shots of Jägermeister on an empty stomach, as opposed to four shots of Jägermeister after having that big cheeseburger, by having more food in the stomach, it slows down the absorption of the alcohol. If you just eat, drink that alcohol on an empty stomach, it can be absorbed very, very rapidly starting there in the stomach and it affects you uh, much, much quicker. And then certain medications like aspirin and things like that can be absorbed there as well. As I mentioned, there are waves that are performed within the small intestine because, I mean, in our stomach, because the goal is to move the food into the small intestine. Uh, these peristaltic waves, again, remember we have this enteric uh, plexus that includes the myenteric plexus, the muscle part of it. And within there basically are some specialized cells known as the cells of Cajal. These are pacemaker cells, much like in the heart, they generate their own action potentials. These produce a basic electrical rhythm or what we call the BER. And it produces these mild peristaltic waves that occur a rate of about three per minute. However, when the food enters our stomach and it stretches, when gastrin is released into our blood and that gets from the blood back to the muscles, we will see a dramatic increase of that activity. And as I mentioned in particular, the contractions become much more powerful in that funnel shaped pyloric region. This is where we're really mashing up that uh, bolus, converting it into the chyme, mixing with the material, and then slowly expressing that chyme into the small intestine to be processed. On average, it takes about two to four hours for the stomach to empty. But again, notice that's a pretty wide average. And the reason for that is it depends dramatically on not just the volume of the food. Obviously, the more food you eat, the longer it is going to take for the stomach to empty, but also the composition of the food. What do you think gets broken down and emptied out of the stomach more rapidly? Carbohydrates or lipids? Carbs. Yeah, carbs. Carbs are able to be broken down much more quickly, passed through much more easily, whereas lipids are much, much slower. And the primary reason for that is the small intestine needs more time to process those lipids. Uh, and so it purposely slows down the stomach so that it has more time. And so it takes the stomach longer to empty. And we'll actually see those controls and talk about those controls in just a minute. Yeah. Speaking of which, here we are here. 
Now, remember, before we talked about how, <clears throat> excuse me, we have both neural and hormonal control of the entire digestive system. However, and again, I wanna make sure this is abundantly clear. What we are talking about right now is specifically regulation of the stomach, regulation of the gastric activity. This regulation of the gastric activity occurs in three phases. The cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. And once again, these phases are identified by the location of the food. Notice also for both of these stages, whoops, hold on, I want that to stay black, but I want this to be green. Notice for all three of these phases, there can be excitatory or there can be inhibitory effects. Now, this one's, as you can see by looking at this picture, it can be a little bit scary. So let's step away from the picture for a minute and away from the lecture and go to the whiteboard and try to make some sense of this. <clears throat> so again, We are talking about the regulation of gastric activity, which again is specifically how we control the stomach. Now, are some of the factors that we're gonna talk about, are they gonna be able to control other parts of the digestive system at the same time? What do you think? If I release gastrin, for instance, is that gonna affect other organs, do you think, besides the stomach? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. However, do we care about that right now? No. I'm asking the question, so what do you think the answer is? No, exactly. All we care about right now is the <clears throat> function of how we are gonna control what happens in the stomach, okay? All right, as we mentioned, there are three phases. So let's draw some lines here to distinguish these three phases. And the first phase, as we mentioned, is the cephalic phase. Based on that name, since all of these phases are identified by where the food is located, where do you think the food is in the cephalic phase? Inside the mouth. Not a bad guess, absolutely. Cephalic means what? Head. Yeah. In the head. Obviously, one of the ways that can be is can be if the food is actually literally in your mouth where you're tasting it et cetera, chewing it and all of those. However, as we talked about, hearing the sizzle of that steak, smelling those roasted vegetables, seeing a commercial of a Carl's Jr. Uh, uh, cheeseburger, are there other ways that the food could be in your head and be affecting uh, the function of your stomach? Yes. Yeah, so it isn't just about tasting, but this can also be smell or sound or just thinking about the food. The key to the cephalic phase is this is before the food reaches the stomach. So even before the food reaches the stomach, we want to be able to control it.
Now, we know we have two ways to control, neural and hormonal. If we're trying to control the stomach before we've even tasted the food, do you think that we're gonna do that neurally, hormonally, or both? Neurally? Neural, absolutely. This is gonna be a neural control. Now, remember with the neural control, we learned about two reflexes, short reflexes and long reflexes. Which one of those do you think is gonna be involved here? Long reflex? These are the long reflexes, absolutely. Right, these are the ones that are gonna go through the central nervous system, which makes sense if you're seeing it, that has to go through there, smelling it or tasting it, that has to go through the central nervous system first. And when we talk about this, is this type of activity gonna be excitatory or inhibitory? Excitatory? Yeah. Excitatory, right? Again, like I mentioned, there you are in your backyard enjoying the sun, and right across that three foot fence, you see your neighbor. And your neighbor is one of those people who buys the nice tri-tip, puts the dry rub on it, sticks it in the bottom of the refrigerator for three days and lets that rub soak in, right? Then they take it out, put it on the barbecue, get that nice solid sear on the outer surface, then move it to the side where it gets that low and slow to up to it's the perfect temperature. Then they bring it out and rest it for 20 minutes and then they cut a big, huge hunk of it. And there they are walking across the yard, bringing it towards you. You were hearing the sizzle, you were smelling it, you're seeing it. <clears throat> and then they trip and they drop it and it lands right on top of some dog poop. Do you just salivate away at the anticipation of eating that meat as it's sitting there on top of the dog poop? It all goes away. No, right? Or if you're a vegetarian, did you have any of those types of reactions as they were cooking that meat? No. So notice this neural control can be either excitatory or uh, inhibitory, right? As you mentioned, it was all excitatory until it hit the dog poop. Then suddenly it became inhibitory. Or like I said, if you're a vegetarian, none of that excited you. But if instead they had marinated some portobello mushrooms and you were smelling the roasting of those coming across, that would be exciting to you. Whereas a three-year-old, does a three-year-old get super excited about roasted mushrooms? No, they're going to sit there kicking and screaming and fighting and complaining about the idea of having to eat a mushroom, right? So absolutely. So in this case, this type of neural control can either be excitatory or it can be inhibitory. You can't have both at the same time. It's going to be one or the other. Right now, as we know, that neural pathway uh, for the excitatory is sympathetic or parasympathetic. Which one is excitatory? Sympathetic. Parasympathetic. For digestion, it's parasympathetic, right? And what is the pathway? What is the primary nerve that carries that signal to the stomach? Vagus nerve. Yeah, it's the vagus nerve. Oops, that is going to. If it was inhibitory, that would be sympathetic. And remember, I'll give it to you again. It's those splanchnic nerves. that come from the uh, collateral ganglia. And if it was the stomach, it would be the celiac collateral ganglia, which I'm sure you remember from 430, that is going to give those effects. And again, the effect on the stomach is basically to get it ready. Again, the goal of digestion is to eat something you wanna eat. So hopefully whatever you're cooking is something that is going to be excitatory. We, accept, we expect it to primarily be excitatory. Right, but can it be inhibitory in the wrong situation? Absolutely. Our goal, let's say it that way, is to prime the pump. 
get the stomach ready. And so the effect is primarily going to cause an increase in gastric juice production. Or let's say it this way, gastric gland activity. So we're producing more gastric juice. And of course that could also activate the G cells, which as we know, uh, can lead to stomach motility. So if you're sitting there waiting for a long period of time, not only do you start producing gastric juice, but can your stomach dark to get rumbly a little bit? Yeah. So it can, in a prolonged state, lead to increased motility of the stomach as well. All right. Hopefully that makes some semblance of sense. Not too confusing, pretty straightforward, hopefully. Yes, any questions on phase one? So it does affect the stomach. It just, it comes from the head. Yeah, again, the whole point of this exercise that we're doing right now is seeing how we control the activity of the stomach. And it turns out we control the activity of the stomach even before the food gets to our stomach. Just the expectation of eating, either because you're seeing or smelling the food, you're tasting the food, or maybe you've gotten so trained that you always eat a lunch at noon that as noon starts to come around, as you start to be aware of the fact that it's noon, can your stomach become start to become active in anticipation of that food because you know this is the time that you're going to eat? Yeah, absolutely. So what's happening here is even before the food gets to our stomach, we are getting the stomach ready to accept food, starting the digestive process in the, the food. We're revving the engine, getting it started. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. Any other questions on this first phase? All right, then let's do the same thing with the second phase. What was the second phase? Anybody catch it? Gastric. I have the notes in front of them. Yeah, the gastric phase. And in the gastric phase, oh, wow, that was really spelled badly. Guess where the food is? In the stomach? Yeah. Here is where the food is in the stomach. So now the food is in the stomach. To reach the stomach, now we're ready to do some work here. Excellent. How do you think this process is going to be controlled? Neural, hormonal, or both? Both. Yeah. <clears throat> this is going to use both neural and hormonal control. And what do you think about this one? Is this one going to be excitatory or inhibitory? That little kid who really, really, really doesn't like broccoli. All right. But you promise to take him out for ice cream or to buy him the new Harry Potter book or whatever, if he eats three sprigs of broccoli. So he takes those three sprigs of broccoli and chokes them down. And once that broccoli hits the stomach, does the stomach care that it was broccoli? No. So once the food hits the stomach, the stomach knows it needs to process the food. So this is going to be Excitatory. All right. Now, let's talk about the neural control. 
This is where we talked about that short reflex. Again, we have a local stimulus. That local stimulus is something like the stretch or some type of composition of the food. Like I said, it could be uh, a change in pH. It could be uh, the presence of certain fatty acids or certain amino acids or uh, certain substrates, something along those lines. Some composition of the food is the stunk stimulus. Remember, it is processed locally by the enteric plexus. And the effect is to get an increase in motility and glandular secretion. And again, by glandular secretion, I mean both gastric juice and gastrin from those G cells. And that leads to our hormonal control. As I mentioned, gastrin is gonna have effect on a lot of the organs of our body. Well, at least a lot of the organs of our digestive system. What we care about right now is the stomach. And in the stomach, that gastrin is going to lead to an increase in motility and an increase in glandular secretions. Because again, our goal here is to process and empty the stomach. There's food in the stomach, we need to process it. Questions on that? All right, I have a question. So we had those three sprigs of broccoli we wanted the kid to eat. And we tried to tempt them with ice cream or we tried to tempt them with the next Harry Potter book. But they say they don't want ice cream. They don't want Harry Potter. So what do you do in that case? Right? As any good parent, you knock them to the floor, you kneel on their chest, you shove the broccoli into their mouth, you pinch their nose so they can't breathe until they swallow it, and then they gulp the uh, broccoli down, right? Okay, don't do those to your kids. But if you did do that to your kids, and again, I'm not condoning it, I'm not telling you to do that, it's not extra credit assignment or anything like that, I'm not telling you to do that, but theoretically, if you did, would that child be mildly upset by that behavior? Okay, maybe not even mildly. Would they be very upset by that behavior? Yeah, and if you were very upset by that behavior, do you think that uh, that stress, that anxiety, that angst, do you think that that's gonna lead to conducive digestion in the uh, stomach? No. So while notice we said this is an excitatory process, because that is what we want it to be, could there be some stressful situations if you're really being forced to eat something you really, really, really don't like, right? I spent all this time cooking the tri-tip. Yeah, it landed in dog food, but gosh darn it, you're gonna eat it whether you like it or not. Or you're a vegetarian and all I have is nothing but meat, right? Or you're just broke up with somebody. And so you're depressed or you're stressed. Can all of those things uh, cause an inhibition to stomach activity, even if there is food in there? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It could. This isn't how we want it to work, right? But 
in those kind of cases when there's some kind of stress or some kind of depression or again you're being forced to eat something you don't want to like it, it is it can potentially be inhibitory and of course being inhibitory is going to impair the normal function of the stomach so yes yeah, so again it can technically be inhibitory in the wrong situations then something like this could be inhibitory but the goal again if you get food in the stomach, the goal is to kick the stomach into gear and start processing that food. All right, questions on the gastric phase. And again, don't kneel on your children and force them to eat. Just withhold your love. All right, questions on that. All right, excellent. That brings us to our third phase. And that third phase is the intestinal phase. Whoops, let's go back to black. Guess where the food is in the intestinal phase? In the intestines. There you go, see how easy that is? Food. And again, we can even be more fancy here. Now it's chyme. The chyme, is being presented to the small intestine. Now, as it's being presented to the small intestine, remember we talked about there are those huge, powerful peristaltic waves and contractions of the pylorus. And each one of those waves of the pyloric sphincter only presents about three milliliters of chyme to the small intestine at a time. Because while the stomach holds the rock star status, the small intestine is the primary functional organ of the digestive system. It is where the majority of the processes take place. And those processes take time. So by presenting the food only a little bit at a time, it has time to process it. In my mind, I always think in terms of that old, I love Lucy, where Lucy's at the candy factory and the conveyor belt is going by and she's got to take the candies and put them in the little cups, right? And at first, when it's just a couple at a time, she has no problem. But as it comes more and more and faster and faster, is she able to keep up and keep processing it properly? No. Right. I know you guys are all very young, but you got to go and watch I Love You See. It's a classic. All right. That's your homework. Don't kneel on your kid's chest, but go watch I Love Lucy. All right. Uh, no, it, she's not able to process in time. So we want to have enough time to process it properly. And so here, again, let's do it this way. We'll jump ahead. Our goal is to give the small intestine the proper amount of time. To process the food. And notice, as we talked about earlier, does all different types of food get processed at equal speed? Did we break down those carbohydrates at the same rate we broke down our fats? No. No. So notice here, the composition of the food matters. what the food actually is makes a difference. Not surprisingly, this is a clearly more complicated process. So again, this is gonna use both neural and hormonal controls. And here it is going to be both excitatory, and inhibitory. Notice, remember with cephalic phase, we said excitatory or inhibitory, right? Now we are saying and. It is gonna be both excitatory and inhibitory. First, we will get a brief excitation and then we will get a longer 
inhibition. I don't know if I'm going to have room for all of this on here. We'll sneak it in. All right, let's talk about the excitatory first. The excitatory occurs because when food is first presented to the small intestine, the small intestine produces gastrin. Now, technically this is intestinal gastrin, but it's still gastrin and it's still being released into the blood supply and the blood is still taking it to the stomach. And does the stomach care where the gastrin comes from? Whether it came from the G cells in the stomach or whether it came from the small intestine, is that gonna have any effect on how that gastrin influences the stomach activity? No. No, absolutely not. It's not gonna have uh, any different effect. So it's still gonna be excitatory. It's still going to increase the motility. It is still going to increase the glandular secretions. So the immediate effect is a brief increase in activity. Basically, the small intestine is saying, oh, awesome. There is food in the stomach. Get that food moving on into me so I can start processing. However, then it's going to need time to process it. And so that time is going to come from the inhibitory effects. The first are going to be neural. This neural effect basically occurs in two ways. We are going to get an increase in sympathetic activation. This increase in sympathetic activation is going to slow the stomach down. And it is also going to, because again, remember these are antagonistic, it is going to cause a decrease in the parasympathetic input. So that's going to slow the stomach down as well. This would be part of a long reflex. But there's also going to be a short reflex Oops. where it is also, we are going to get a direct inhibition uh, to the muscle of the stomach as well. So again, the, there's going to be a neural reflex that is going to inhibit the muscle of the stomach. Again, Notice both of these effects, first the gastrin and then this neural effect just simply comes from the stretch of the small intestine. When chyme is first presented to the small intestine, it stretches and these events occur. But remember, we also said that the composition of the food matters. And where that matters is with the hormones. In the case of the small intestine, the small intestine has many enteroendocrine cells. And these many enteroendocrine cells are going to produce specific hormones and they're gonna produce specific hormones based on the food. We'll actually talk about the hormones of this a little bit later, but for right now, uh, basically we're gonna make these hormones on the, uh, based on the type of food, the composition of the food. And most of these hormones are things like gastro inhibitory peptidase. Now, what do you think a gastro inhibitory peptidase does? Inhibits peptin? Well, it, yeah, it inhibits the stomach, absolutely. So it inhibits the activity of the stomach, like producing pepsin and stuff like that, absolutely. So most of these are going to have an inhibitory effect. And that effect is going to be, again, based on the food. We'll talk more about specific hormones a little bit later when we get to the small intestine.
Uh, but for now, we just need to know that the hormones that are going to be uh, produced are going to be produced based on the food, and they're going to have an inhibitory effect. So notice we're getting both an inhibitory and an excitatory effect. All right, we've done this here on the board. Let's go back and look at this with the pretty pictures, because I think the pretty pictures do a nice job of showing this as well. Again, here we see our cephalic phase. Remember, this one is excitatory or inhibitory, depending pretty much on what's going up here in your noggin, right? Um, this is the cephalic phase before the food reaches the stomach. And it is all neural. Taste, smell, hearing, seeing, thinking about that. Of course, if it's excitatory, because that's what we want it to be, that's going to occur via the vagus nerve. But like I said, if it's a food you don't like, or that food is dropped on the floor, you can have an inhibitory effect as well. Notice this neural input from the vagus nerve stimulates the production of our gastric glands. So we start getting that secretions, getting the stomach ready for food. But remember also it can stimulate those enteroendocrine cells to produce gastrin and that gastrin can increase our motility. All right, again, I think this first phase was pretty straightforward, so hopefully that makes some semblance of sense. I think the second phase is equally pretty straightforward. Again, this one, once the food's in there, we want it to process that food. So our goal is for it to be excitatory. Right, notice, let's cheat for a second. Notice as we see here, in our gastric phase, we can, it can be inhibitory, right? It can be inhibitory, but it's because you're emotionally upset or because stress has increased the acidity or some other type of thing has happened. In those cases, right, we can get that inhibition, but, as long as you're not being kneeled on and forced to eat, hopefully you're eating something you want to be eating. So again, the goal of this gastric phase is for it to be excitatory. Here it's all local. Stretch of the food, change in the pH, look, sub, uh, some kind of substance that is located, stimulating some type of stretch receptor, some type of chemoreceptor. And notice it stimulates that local reflex, the submucosal and myenteric plexus that collectively form our enteric plexus, our gut brain, and they stimulate our gastric glands. And that gastric gland includes our G cells, which make gastrin, which stimulate gastric juice production and stimulate the smooth muscle. So we have all this local activity with that goal of processing the food. And like I said, depending on the volume, depending on the composition, anywhere from two to four hours to empty the stomach. And again, I think this one is pretty simple and straightforward, hopefully. The only part of this that's a little bit tricky is this intestinal phase. The reason this is a little bit tricky is, again, this one is not, again, we want to control the stomach, but we're controlling the stomach based on what's happening in the small intestine. That is why this is the intestinal phase. Some of that processed chyme is now being presented to the small intestine. And as a result of that, we're gonna get first a very brief excitatory process. And then that's gonna be followed up with a longer inhibitory process. Right. The process starts first excitatory. We get the production of gastrin. 
and that gastrin stimulates the stomach, just like the gastrin produced by the G cells stimulates the stomach. But like we talked about, this is a very brief effect. Instead, and notice this brief effect, I should also say, is only hormonal. Right? And it is only gastrin. This is different from our inhibitory reflex. Whoops. Our inhibitory reflex, remember, is both hormonal and neural. Starting with the enterogastric reflex, this is, as I mentioned, that local reflex. This is the short reflex where we get that short return. But remember, we also are going to get that stimulation of the sympathetic pathway. through that long reflex, through the central nervous system, through the autonomic nervous system, we are gonna get a decrease in activity from those splanchnic nerves, from our sympathetic pathways. So we have both short and long reflexes decreasing the activity. One, by turning down the muscle, by turning down the parasympathetic input, and two, by increasing the sympathetic input, all of which slows the activity of the stomach down. But as I also mentioned, based on the composition of the food, we're gonna produce hormones in our small intestine. And those hormones like cholecystokinin, like gastroinhibitory peptidase, like secretin, all of which are going to, again, decrease specific activities of the stomach. And like I said, when we talk about the small intestine, we will actually uh, list uh, both the triggers uh, and the effects of the specific hormones. So we'll deal with that part of it later. For now, we just need to know when we're talking about uh, gastric activity, that these hormones are going to inhibit the activity and they're gonna do so based on the composition of the food. All righty, questions on that? And make sure if you have questions, ask them because to me, this sounds like an awesome essay question that you might see on the exam. So if you don't understand this regulation of gastric activity, uh, now's the time to ask. If there's anything this important, I'd be shocked if it wasn't on the exam in some form or another. But that's just me. All right. And again, your book's got this pretty picture, which now we've had a chance to talk about it, hopefully makes a little bit more sense. Again, we talked about the sight, thought, sound, smell of the food, all of these things before the food gets to the stomach or right, your state of mind or the fact that you don't like the food or any of those things. We talked about primarily the excitatory, but how stress can influence that for the gastric phase. And notice we talked about this brief excitation from the production of gastrin but then our local reflexes, our long reflexes, and the hormones that all lead to that primarily control of the stomach. Because really, at this point, we're not controlling what the stomach is doing in processing the food. We're controlling how quickly the stomach is presenting the food to the small intestine. All right, last call. Questions on this? All right, again, here we have that simple picture. Again, remember our goal here is twofold. We want to convert our bolus into chyme, including the chemical mechanical processing of the food. 
And then, like I said, a large amount of that churning is taking place here in the pyloric region. That funnel contains about 30 milliliters of chyme. But remember, with that big peristaltic wave, it only presents about three, millil oops, about three milliliters of that chyme to the small intestine with each wave. So there you go. We have talked gross anatomy of the stomach, microscopic anatomy of the stomach, uh, physiology of the stomach, and now regulation of the stomach. Everything you ever wanted to know about the stomach and more. Questions on that? All right, from here then, not surprisingly, we are gonna to leave to go into the small intestine. I always find this term somewhat ironic. Remember, we said in that cadaver, how long is your alimentary canal? 30 feet. 30 feet. Of those 30 feet, 20 of those feet are the small intestine. How the heck is anything that is 20 feet long called the small intestine? Is it based on the size of the diameter? Yeah, exactly. It's called the small intestine based on its diameter. Exactly. It is small in diameter, not in length. Oops. It is small in diameter, not small in length. It is huge in length. Anything 20 feet long is gonna be chopped up into parts. And there are three, both functional and structural divisions to our small intestine. Again, like most of the organs we have talked about, it is bounded at both ends by a valve. We already know the proximal valve, the pyloric sphincter. At the distal end, the valve down here is called the ileocecal valve. Is that because Bob ileocecal is the one who identified it? Why is it called the ileocecal valve? Anyone know? The ileum and the cecum? Yeah. The very distal part of the uh, small intestine is known as the ileum and this big pouch-like structure of the large intestine, the beginning of the large intestine is called the cecum. So it is the valve between the ileum and the cecum, so it's called the ileocecal valve. Excellent. So we know the ileum is the distal part of the small intestine. What are the other two parts? The duodenum and the jejunum. Excellent, perfect, absolutely. The duodenum is the proximal part. Duodenum or duodenum, both are acceptable ways of, 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 uh, uh, of pronouncing it, I should say. It means actually about 10 fingers, because that's about how long it is. It's about uh, 10 to 12 inches in length. Remember the duodenum is the part that is um, behind the abdominal pelvic cavity. And what was the term we used for that? Retroperitoneal. Excellent. It is indeed retroperitoneal. It uh, wraps around the head of the pancreas. So we kind of see that there and then it tucks in here. From there, it leads into the jejunum, which makes up almost 40% of the small intestine which then feeds into, as we mentioned, the longest portion, the ileum, which makes up the majority of them. Now, if I were to throw a dart at this, like for instance, this part right here, or this part right here, can I tell just by looking at this, with those two parts that I at, pointed at, whether they're uh, jejunum or ileum? No. No. Right? It's not like all the superior stuff is the jejunum and all the inferior stuff is the ileum. Again, these are all kind of twist and turned within each other. So from the gross anatomy, we really can't tell them much apart. 
uh, but we can histologically. Oh, and since I mentioned it, the duodenum is retroperitoneal, but remember the uh, jejunum and ileum are both uh, intraperitoneal. Uh, so uh, they have cirrhosis, whereas the duodenum has an adventitia. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Much like we did with the stomach, we need to talk about uh, the gross anatomy, the microscopic anatomy, the physiology, and the control of it. So those are all things that we absolutely positively need to do. But this is another good stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our second break here. It looks like it is 2.50. So we will come back at, I guess that makes it actually 3.05. At 3.05, we will uh, restart and I will start the recording at that point. So again, I'll ask again, any last information on the stomach before we uh, take our next break? All right, I will see you in 15 minutes then. Okay, so we were in our small intestine. We've already started talking about it a little bit, but as I also mentioned, uh, the small intestine, while the stomach gets the rock star status, the small intestine is really the major digestive organ. Uh, this is where we complete all of the chemical and all of the mechanical digestion that was begun in other places, right? We started mechanical digesting in the mouth with the uh, chewing, mastication, uh, continued with the churning of the stomach, uh, continued for the proteins with the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, and we started the chemical digestion. Remember salivary amylase in the mouth, pepsin in the stomach, lingual lipase in the stomach. Those things all began in other places, but here is where we're going to finish it. This is also where we will start and finish the breakdown of our macromolecules. Once those things are broken down, it is also in the, in the small intestine where a majority of the substances in the water are absorbed. We know we did some absorption in the mouth. We knew we did some absorption in the stomach. We will do some absorption in the large intestine, but 90% of the water and substances that are absorbed occur in the small intestine. As we talked about way back at the beginning of this, we know we have that special, blah, 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 that special blood vessel pathway. Obviously arteries go straight to the organs of the alimentary canal, but remember the veins don't go straight back to the heart. Instead, they go to the liver first via that special bloodway pathway. What was that special bloodway pathway that carries the blood to the liver before it takes it back? The hepatic portal. Yeah, that hepatic portal system. Excellent. Uh, so that is going to lead us on our merry way to the, uh, to the liver, where the magic happens uh, that we'll talk about uh, probably in the next class. And it is highly, highly specialized. Uh, just like the stomach had its specializations, the small intestine has its specializations as well. Those specializations tend to be more towards the proximal end. But as I mentioned, while looking at, if I just randomly ripped a piece of small intestine out of the stomach, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell what it was. When we look at it under the microscope, we can distinguish it. So you will be responsible for identifying the different regions of the small intestine, uh, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum histologically. And so we'll look at that today as well. Let's start with the gross anatomy. Uh, notice again, as we mentioned, obviously this must be the ileum uh, or the jejunum because they have given us a serosa on the outer surface and a mesentery holding it in place. And remind me again what we call the mesentery that holds the small intestine in place. Mesentery is the generic word. What's the specific term we will use uh, for the mesentery exclusively for the small intestine? Mesentery proper? Yeah. 
Right, mesentery proper, exactly. So it is the mesentery proper. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Mesentery proper. Excellent. So we have that. Spectacular. Notice we are back down to just two layers of small of smooth muscle and inner circular and an outer longitudinal, no longer oblique. That oblique is unique to the stomach. Notice again, we have a submucosa and a mucosa. And notice a couple of things here that we want to see. Much like the stomach, there are large folds that are made of both the mucosa and the submucosa. The brain has stopped working. Uh, mucosa and submucosa. In this case, these are called the circular folds or the plicae circularis. or the circular folds. What is their function? Are they to allow the expansion the same way that the stomach was able to expand? Do we need to fit 17 cheeseburgers into the small intestine at the same time? No, it all comes out three milliliters at a time. Right, so obviously it's not for expansion. So what might these circular folds, these big, huge invaginations of the mucosa and the submucosa be for? Absorption? Yeah, absolutely. One of it is going to be to increase surface area for absorption. The other thing is, again, we have a lot of processing to do. So having these speed bumps in the middle of this uh, organ help to slow down the flow of the chyme as well. So the same way the speed bumps slow you down when you're driving through the parking lot, right? These are going to slow you down as well. Notice, though, however, as we look closely at this illustration on these circular folds, there are these finger-like extensions that stick out. These finger-like extensions, which we see an enlargement of right here, are the mucosal villi. These villi are projections of the mucosa only. What is their function? Come on, guys. It's, you got to remember, this is my last class of the week. This is Friday. I could easily already be drinking right now if I just had you guys watch recorded lectures. The whole point of me being here with you is to make this interactive, to make sure you get in the information. Oh, I don't ask for much. I don't ask for you to have your uh, cameras on and stuff like that. I ask you to not snore on camera, but to occasionally interact with me. So throw me a bone every once in a while. What do you think the function of these villi are? Movement of the food through the small okay. intestine? Not a bad guess, but remember, cilia are the things that are motile. This is actually made of the mucous membrane. This is a fold. Notice if we look at this up close view, uh, here, let me switch to a pencil. Um, each of these is an individual cell. So notice this big finger-like extension has tons of cells lining the surface of it. So this is a big extension of the uh, epithelial tissue and the lamina propria, right? The, the mucosa. So this is a big, huge extension of the mucosa, which does what? Well, what did the circular the folds do? Blood vessels. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, lymph capillaries. And remember, not just any capillaries, but those special lacteals. And what do those blood vessels and lacteals do? They absorb material. Yeah, they're gonna, right. 
all that cheeseburger that you had for breakfast, those bits and pieces of it are absorbed into the blood supply, absorbed into the lymph and taken back to the heart. So notice by having these finger-like extensions, not only can they house the blood vessels, but if you're gonna be absorbing, you wanna increase surface area. And notice, and again, your book's done a nice job of doing this, it took just a couple of the cells off the top of one of these villi and showed us the simple columnar epithelial cells. These simple columnar epithelial cells are actually called absorptive cells. Because guess what these absorptive cells do? They absorb. Yeah. Uh, that are responsible for, they absorb the nutrients. And notice what organelle do they have on the top of them? Microvilli. They have microvilli, absolutely. And what's the function of those microvilli? Absorption of nutrients. Yeah, they increase surface area for absorption. Notice not one, not two, but three big specializations that are going to help to increase the surface area of our small intestine. Our small intestine could just be like a hose you have in the backyard, where it could just be smooth on the inner surface. But with all of these specializations, we get a massive, massive increase in the surface area. 100 to almost 600 times the surface area of that organ if it was just smooth on the inner surface. Massive, massive, massive increase that again is going to slow the calm down uh, and it is going to increase the surface area. Give us more time and more surface area for processing. Again, here's another little illustration showing one of the villi. Remember, again, if you think about these three specializations, the circular folds is made of the mucosa and the submucosa. Our villi are made of the mucosa only and our microvilli are the organelles of the individual cells. So notice here we are looking at a villi. So we are looking and we can see the absorptive cells that are lining the surface of this villi. And we can see the little bit of microvilli they put on the top, the occasional goblet cell, because this is a mucous membrane after all. And as we mentioned, notice this is where the capillaries, those special lymph capillaries, the lacteals, the blood capillaries, and notice our nerves for controlling stuff are going to be in here as well. Now, remember, this is receiving the chyme from your stomach which anybody who's ever had a baby spit up on them knows that that chyme is very acidic, right? When you don't burp that baby properly, or heck, even if you do burp them, you jostle them a little too much, and that milk comes up, it smells like it's curdled. It smells like it's turned bad. Well, it's really just the acidity that has been mixed with that to make the chyme. So this is an incredibly acidic material that is being pumped into our small intestine. And we have all these enzymes to break down the proteins and the lipids and the carbohydrates that make up our food. But our cells are also made up of proteins and lipids and carbohydrates. These cells are also sensitive to that hydrochloric acid in the chyme. And unlike the stomach, do we have a thick layer of mucus that protects our small intestine? I'll answer that question in just a second. Do we have a thick layer of mucus that protects our, the, the, the epithelial cells of our small intestine? No. 
No, right? So not surprisingly, they're constantly damaged. An epithelial cell of your small intestine only lasts about three days. So again, they have a very short, very small, very rapid life, and they're constantly, constantly being replaced. Now, remember, the lacteal is a special lymphatic capillary. Remember, in most of the parts of the body, as we saw, we have these big capillary beds in like the arms and in the legs. And then as we saw, the uh, lymphatic capillaries will kind of come into that capillary bed and kind of branch inside that capillary bed to collect the material. Here in the villi, rather than having this big branching lymphatic capillary, we have one big, large, long, single lymphatic capillary. And so that lacteal is a very special capillary found in only one place in the villi of the small intestine. And they're gonna play a huge role in helping us to absorb our uh, lipids and lipid soluble vitamins and other materials as well. Awesome, great question. Any others? All right, spectacular. Here we have the gross anatomy, again, showing the uh, duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Again, your book and their illustrations do a nice job of always showing the jejunum separate up and superior, the ileum down and inferior. But remember, it's in real life, it's not going to be this pretty. However, what we do need to be able to do is recognize uh, it histologically, and we'll do that in a second. A couple quick more nice illustrations. Again, here we see this nice view where again, we are seeing that the circular folds are made up of both the submucosa and the mucosa. Whereas notice the villi are just made up of the mucosa. And then of course, what we're not seeing are the cells on top of this that would have their microvilli sticking out. But this does do a nice job of showing us that relationship between the circular folds and the villi. Here we also see the villi. Again, we are not seeing the individual simple columnar cells that would line this. And we know they would have microvilli coming off of them. We're not seeing that here. We're seeing a lymphatic nodule just hanging out in here. Notice we have our two layers of smooth muscle, our serosa on the outer surface, our submucosa. And again, the villi are just made up of the mucosa. So notice we can see that uh, muscularis mucosa, which is our dividing point. There is one more thing here that we haven't talked about yet. Notice at the base of the villi are these invaginations that kind of look a little bit like the gastric glands. They're not gastric glands. These are basically glands of the intestine. So of course they're called intestinal glands, except they're not because anatomists hate us. They're called intestinal crypts. But these intestinal crypts, as we look at this under the microscope, we'll see contain a large number of goblet cells. They are gonna to help to produce some mucus that is gonna to help to buffer and protect the small intestine. Again, we're not gonna have a thick layer of it, but this is a mucous membrane and it is gonna produce mucus. And so these intestinal crypts help to produce some of the mucus that's gonna keep the chyme moving through our small intestine. Again, I love some of these pictures from your textbook. Again, this does such a great job of showing that difference between our circular fold, that plicae circularis, where again, we can see that muscularis mucosa that comes up. So we see it is indeed made of the submucosa and the mucosa, whereas the villi are just made out of the mucosa. Now, as I mentioned, we can tell the circular fold because of the submucosa. 
But the submucosa is also where we're going to look to tell the three regions of the small intestine apart. The good news is the small intestine is going to be pretty easy to identify. Yeah, if you get lucky enough to see one of these plicae circularis, that's a good dead giveaway you're looking at the small intestine. But just merely the fact that we have these villi that stick out make it pretty obvious. So when we look at something like this histologically, lo and behold, the first thing that stands out to us very prominently are these villi that extend out. You see many villi, that's pretty much a dead giveaway. You are looking at the small intestine. Notice we see the intestinal crypts containing goblet cells that even at a small uh, low magnification like this, we can clearly see. Notice we can clearly see the one, two distinct different orientations of smooth muscle that make up our muscularis. And of course, the one I put a circle on, what layer is that? Longitudinal. It's closest to the lumen, so that makes it the... Now, if not the longitudinal, what is it? Circular. Circular. Whereas the one down here would then be the longitudinal. Excellent. But remember, as I mentioned, if we want to know, so great, right away, we see two layers of smooth muscle that tells us it's definitely not the stomach. We see all of these villi sticking out, dead giveaway that we're in the small intestine. So now we have to figure out what part, what region of the small intestine we're in. And where did I tell you to go to do that? The mucosa. Not the mucosa, but the submucosa. So notice to find the submucosa, I have to find the muscularis mucosa. And once I find the muscularis mucosa, I know that the small intestine, I mean, probably the submucosa is this layer down here. This is the submucosa. Now notice when I look at this submucosa, I see a massive number of glands, massive, massive number of glands. These glands, even at a low magnification, I can see are containing a tremendous number of goblet cells. These glands are responsible for producing a large amount of uh, mucus and a large amount of bicarbonate. Any idea what bicarbonate is? A buffer? Yeah, it is a buffer, right? That buffer is going to be important for neutralizing the acidity of the chyme that comes out of the small intestine. Now, these glands were first identified by good old Bob Bruner. So these are known as Bruner's glands, but these glands are also known as duodenal glands. And based on that bit of information, what region of the small intestine do you think we're in? Duodenum. Yeah, the duodenum, the duodenum, absolutely, All right? Which makes sense. We want that buffer, we want that mucus to help to neutralize the acidity, because the duodenum is the very first part of the small intestine that gets the chyme. So these, uh, these Bruner's or du duodenal glands are the dead giveaway. We are in the duodenum, the duodenum. Professor? Yes. So for every section of the small intestine, will they all have the, uh, the plicae circularis? Yes, but are we necessarily going to see it? Do we see the plicae circularis in this view? I don't think so. No. So you're right. From a gross anatomy standpoint, yes, every single part of the small intestine is going to have plicae circularis. They're more prominent in the proximal part. They're less prominent in the distal, but they're still there. However, when we're looking at one small piece on a microscopic slide, are we necessarily going to see it? No. Got it. So whenever we're trying to distinguish, we should always look at the villi at the top, like the new, because they're so numerous, yeah. and then the submucosa to see the different, like whatever it, it, it holds. Exactly. Let's do a second one. 
once again, I see, right, big pronounced villi in small intestinal crypts. So that did give away what organ am I looking at here? Small intestine. Small intestine. So where do I look next? Submucosa. And lo and behold, I see something that looks very familiar to me here in the submucosa. What the heck is all of that? Lymph nodes? Not lymph nodes, but they're lymph something. Follicles? Lymph follicles, absolutely. Big clusters of lymph follicles in a specific region of the small intestine were called what again? Bayer's patches? Pyre's patches, absolutely. Here I have a big, huge chunk of Pyre's patches. And what region of the small intestine had the Pyre's patches? Helium. Right. It's the one closest to the large intestine. So the part closest to the large intestine has the Pyre's patches. The part closest to the stomach has the duodenal glands to protect us from the chyme. This is protecting us from the bacteria in the small intestine, I mean, in the large intestine. Here, a uh, beautiful view. Here, we see these beautiful villi. We see the goblet cells that are occasionally happening on them. We see the intestinal crypts with even more goblet cells. I see one layer and two layers of smooth muscle. And here is my submucosa. Is my submucosa absolutely filthy with pyrus patches? No. Do I see a massive number of mucus and buffer producing Goblet cells, those uh, Brunner cells, those duodenal cells? No. So then what region of the small intestine am I in here? The jejunum. The jejunum. Notice the jejunum has the longest, the largest villa. Clearly looking at this, you can see they're very large, very prominent. But that can be a little subjective especially when you don't have the other images to compare it to. What isn't subjective is what's going on in the submucosa. Duodenum has duodenal glands. Ilium has pyrus patches and the jejunum has neither. So once you realize it is the small intestine, to easily identify what region of the small intestine you're in, look in the submucosa. And the submucosa will tell you what it is. Questions on that? All right. It really is just that simple. All right, that is the gross and the microscopic anatomy. So let's talk about the activity. As I mentioned, the uh, intestines become active when the chyme is presented to the duodenum. So the small intestine plays a role in controlling the activity of the stomach. It produces intestinal juice. Again, the average is two liters, but again, that varies dramatically on the number of times you eat, the volume of the food you eat, the composition of the food you eat. This intestinal juice is primarily uh, mucus, water, and bicarbonate ions. And again, those bicarbonate ions are going to help to neutralize the acidity of that chyme as it is entering into the small intestine, maintaining the pH of the small intestine, because in the small intestine, there's also gonna be a massive number of enzymes 
doing their jobs. And as we know, enzymes are dependent on pH. So it is vitally important that we maintain the appropriate pH of the small intestine. Remember also, we have those massive number of enteroendocrine cells that are gonna produce all those hormones. And remember, as we mentioned, that hormones are gonna be produced based on the composition of the food. Now, do you think the small intestine just sits there doing nothing until the chyme is actually presented to it? So I'll answer the question for you. No, of course not, right? When you are thinking, tasting, smelling, hearing the food, those same neurons that are stimulating the stomach are gonna still stimulate the small intestine as well. So it's gonna get ready because more than likely it's already processing food from the previous meal. So we're gonna start uh, working and getting rid of the food that is in there so we can make room of next ones. And again, it's gonna be controlled both neurally by local reflexes and also by hormones as well. But like I said, the big difference between the stomach and the small intestine is the small intestine cares what the composition of the food is. The stomach doesn't care whether you had a bowl full of spaghetti or a bowl full of broccoli or a bowl full of earthworms. It's gonna process it the same, right? Your small intestine makes cares, whether it's a carbohydrate, whether it's a lipid, whether it's a fat. Let's talk about some of the examples. As we mentioned, when that chyme is first presented to the um, small intestine. There are stretch receptors there, and those stretch receptors are going to respond by stimulating the goblet cells and stimulating the Brunner's glands. Releasing that mucus, releasing that uh, buffer to start to get ready to neutralize the acidity of the chyme. Remember the stretch of the stomach, and, uh, pardon me, the stretch of the small intestine and the presence of proteins in the chyme will stimulate the small intestine to produce gastrin. Remember this gastrin works exactly the same as the gastrin that is gonna uh, produced in the stomach. So this gastrin, as we talked about, stimulates stomach activity. but it also stimulates the, the small intestine as well. It increases the motility of the small intestine. And one of the most important things that it does is it relaxes the ileocecal valve. Remember that is the exit of the small intestine. As food is presented to your small intestine, your small intestine says, uh-oh, I've got new food to process. We've got to get rid of the old. So by opening the ileocecal valve, it can move the old chyme that is being processed into the large intestine. Now, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but if you have a little kid you've actually been aware of this process. Because when your five-year-old comes to the dinner table, sits down at the dinner table, takes three bites of food, and then jumps out of his chair. And why does your five-year-old jump out of his chair as soon as he's taken those three bites of food? He's done. Well, okay, could be that he's done, or it could be what else? Come on, I know some of you out there have kids. After a kid's taken a couple bites of food, what do many kids need to do right after they've done that? Run to the bathroom. Yeah, run to the bathroom to poop, All right? Why? Because that food starting to get processed as they're stimulating the introduction of new food into the intestinal system, into the digestive system, the, digest the intestinal system is getting rid of the food that was already in there. And when you're a little kid and you have a small intestinal tract, that new food presenting to the large intestine stimulates the colon, stimulates the defecation reflex. 
So they take a couple bites of food and then they have to go poop. And like I said, the composition matters. If uh, your meal includes a large amount of lipids or particular amino acids, we produce a hormone called cholecystokinin. It's an alphabet soup to spell out, but on an essay question, the good news is after you've spelled it out once, you can abbreviate it CCK. Cholecystokinin helps in the digestion of those lipids. Remember, as we mentioned, lipid digestion takes more work. So this cholecystokinin does a couple of things. It stimulates our pancreas to release more pancreatic lipase. So we can chemically break down those lipids. It also stimulates the liver. What does the liver do that helps us with lipids? Makes bile. Makes bile, absolutely. Right, so it makes that bile to help to emulsify that fat. That liver is constantly making bile, but you're not constantly using it. So when you're not using it, that bile gets stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. So it stimulates the gallbladder to release that concentrated and very efficient bile into our small intestine. Our liver and our pancreas have to release these secretions into our small intestine. And once again, there's a valve that controls that. Again, it's an alphabet soup, but it tells you everything about it. Hepato, which of course refers to the liver. Pancreatic, which of course refers to the pancreas. So it's the hepatopancreatic sphincter. And when we look at the liver and the gallbladder, we'll actually see, and the pancreas for that matter, we'll actually see this, sphinct this sphincter and where it's located in relation to these organs and the small intestine. Cholecystokinin, I don't think I have it in here. Let me double check. Nope, I didn't. So I'll sneak it in the bottom. Uh, also, it inhibits the uh, stomach. As I mentioned, if our goal here is to take more time to process our food, then as a result of this, we want to decrease the motility. If we decrease the motility, then as a result of that, uh, we are getting uh, less chyme presented to the small intestine or presented at least at a slower rate. And so again, our small intestine is gonna have more time to process and conversely, it takes more time for the stomach to empty. Glucose. And certain particular fatty acids are uh, easier to break down, but again, still require a little bit of time. As I mentioned, they produce a hormone called gastric inhibitory peptase or peptide. Not surprisingly, this hormone stimulates insulin release. Why might we wanna release insulin into our blood? Store glucose. Yeah, because if we've got a lot of glucose in our stomach or in our small intestine, that means very shortly we're going to have a lot of glucose in our blood. And remind me again, what cells in what organ produce insulin? The beta cells of the pancreas. There you go. The beta cells of the pancreas are going to produce that insulin, uh, getting that insulin ready to deal with all that glucose that's going to be in there. If there is a large amount of glucose in our meal, do we necessarily, is that hydrochloric acid gonna help to break down that glucose? What do you think? Does hydrochloric acid help in the mechanical breakdown of glucose? Is glucose sensitive to pH changes the same way that proteins are? No. No. So hydrochloric acid isn't helping in the breakdown of glucose. 
So do we necessarily want the stomach making a lot of hydrochloric acid that could potentially damage the small intestine if that hydrochloric acid isn't doing anything? No, absolutely not. So again, this uh, gastric inhibitory peptidase is going to decrease, not necessarily the motility, because go on, bring on the food on down, but we do want to slow down the secretions. Because if the chyme is too acidic, it can damage the small intestine. Luckily, if the chyme is too acidic, our small intestine produces a hormone called secretin. And secretin, among the other things that it does, tells the stomach to stop producing acid and slow down. Don't give me any more chyme right now because it's really acidic and I need to buffer it. I need to neutralize it. I need a little bit more time to process it. So slow down your rate of giving it to me and stop that acid production because this chyme is too acidic and I can't work with it. So again, notice as we talked about, the different compositions of the food we eat cause the small intestines to produce different types of hormones to optimize the efficiency of its processing. Also, if it's too acidic, it's going to stimulate the pancreatic acini, right? Not the alpha and beta cells, not the pancreatic islets, but it's going to stimulate the pancreas. Notice not this time to make more enzymes, instead to make more bicarbonate to, again, neutralize the acidity. Your book's got a great table that talks about these. Notice we haven't even talked about all the ones on the list. We didn't talk about histamine. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, molten, molten or uh, somatosatans or other ones like that as well. Again, your book talks about these, but focus on the ones we discussed. The ones we discussed are the ones that I will hold you responsible for on the exam. Know where they're produced, small intestine, duh. Uh, know the trigger for them and know the functions for them. So for these, what are they, five hormones? Uh, know, the, uh, know the trigger, know the effect, and know the targets. All right. Questions on that? All right. Excellent. As we mentioned, as our small intestine gets the food from the stomach, it's going to process it. It's going to use both uh, uh, chemical and electrical stimuli to modify the behavior of the stomach so that we have time to complete the chemical and mechanical breakdown of our food. Because once it's completely mechanically and, and mecha uh, chemically and mechanically broken down, we can then absorb it. All right, we've talked about the glandular activity. We've talked about the endocrine activity. We haven't talked about the mechanical activity. Although we did talk a little bit about this way back when we were talking about the basic anatomy. Remember we said in the small intestine, we have these alternating contractions of the circular layer, a process we called segmentation. And again, segmentation was not about propulsion. Segmentation is about the mechanical breakdown of food. Of the food and about basically moving it back and forth across the surface, which basically increases the surface area, which as we know is going to increase absorption. Lastly, I think I mentioned this, but I'll mention it again here because again, it's important. On the surface of our, on those absorptive cells, on those microvilli, there are also a large number of membrane bound enzymes. These enzymes are actually called the brush border enzymes. 
uh, because they are on those microvilli of the absorptive cells that look like the bristles of a brush. And so by rubbing the food back and forth across these brush border enzymes, that again is going to help to facilitate uh, chemical breakdown as well. So it helps in the mechanical digestion, it helps in the chemical digestion, and it helps in the absorption. So this segmentation is a very important function of the small intestine, but it has nothing to do with propulsion. We do need to propulse our food through there. So again, it is going to use peristalsis and peristaltic waves to move the food from one end of the small intestine to another. Remember also, we have to affect valves and affect the movement of our food. We talked about these examples, but I'll mention them again. Remember we talked about how the gastroileal reflex, stretch of the stomach is going to stimulate the secretions of the small intestine, get the small intestine ready. But remember, we also talked about how it relaxes the ileocecal valve using the hormone gastrin to get the old food out of the way to make room for new food. And again, depending on the volume, depending on the composition of the food, it can take anywhere from three to six hours for your small intestine to empty. All right, questions on that? All right. Last thing I wanna talk about for today, before we talk about our absorptive pathways, which like I said, is gonna take a little bit more time. So we're gonna save that for Tuesday and I guarantee one of these four absorptive pathways is going to be an essay question on your exam. I wanna talk a little bit about the accessory structures. We kind of already hinted at it, uh, but they are primarily the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. The pancreas is the one we're most familiar with because this is a picture, a histology picture we have seen before. Notice again, there are basically two main types of cells that we have in our pancreas because our pancreas is a mixed gland. We have our pancreatic islet, which is that cluster of alpha and beta and gamma and delta cells producing all the hormones. And we cared about the alpha and betas and the ones that produce the glycogen, uh, I mean, the glucagon and the, uh, and the insulin. But surrounding that, we also have all of these pancreatic acini, these ball-shaped glandular structures that feed all of this pancreatic juice into ducts that are then fed out of the pancreas, primarily out via that, as we mentioned, hepatopancreatic sphincter into the duodenum. Remember, the duodenum is retroperitoneal, and so is the head and the body of the pancreas. However, the tail of the pancreas does stick out a little bit into the abdominal pelvic cavity, and so it is technically intraperitoneal. So it's a mixed gland functionally, and anatomically, it's a mixed gland. Two-thirds retroperitoneal, one-third intraperitoneal. Notice all of those acini are going to feed into our main pancreatic duct, which, as I mentioned, is going to be released out that hepatopancreatic sphincter, where it meets up with the ducts coming from the liver and the gallbladder. But remember, we said this particular uh, valve for this opening is controlled by that hormone cholecystokinin. That only is uh, released when lipids are present. But remember our pancreas has other enzymes it wants to release as well. And so you will notice that there is actually a second opening, 
a second, what is known as accessory pancreatic duct that is open all the time, allowing bicarbonate, allowing um, enzymes to be released into the small intestine at all times. Notice, I think we have, okay, here's a pretty picture. Again, emphasizing the difference between the uh, exocrine acini and the endocrine uh, pancreatic islets. Here's the thing that I wanted to show you. Notice, again, that common bile duct comes down from the liver and the gallbladder. Our main pancreatic duct comes in here. And notice the circular muscle of the duodenum enlarges and wraps around it, forming that hepatopancreatic sphincter. That sphincter feeds into a large cavity known as the duodenal ampulla. And that ampulla forms a finger-like projection that sticks out into the small intestine known as the duodenal papillae. And again, the function of this valve is controlled by the hormone cholecystokinin. All right, questions on that? All right, again, depending on the volume of food, the number of times you eat, the composition of the food that you eat, on average, our pancreas produces about a liter and a half of pancreatic juice during the course of the day. Exocrine secretion contains enzymes, contains water, contains ions. It is alkaline in nature. Not surprisingly, we want to cancel the uh, acidity of the chyme that is released uh, from our stomach. So it's going to contain a large amount of bicarbonate and other phosphate buffers to neutralize the acidity. And control of the pancreas is going to be controlled neurally. Uh, both by the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Again, starting when you first think, see, hear, food. But again, uh, it also is controlled primarily by cholecystokinin. As I mentioned, the small intestine is where the majority of the chemical breakdown of food occurs. And so not surprisingly, the pancreas produces a massive number of enzymes, dozens of enzymes that help in this process. This includes uh, trypsin, but also chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase. Anyone have any idea what these three enzymes break down? Yes. Is it protein? Proteins, absolutely. Excellent. Don't worry, it gets easier from here. Uh, the pancreas produces pancreatic amylase. What does that break down? Carbohydrates. There you go. It produces pancreatic lipase. Guess what that breaks down? Lipids. There you go. It produces ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease. Guess what that breaks down? RNA and DNA. Yeah, our nucleic acids. Absolutely. All of our macromolecules. We have enzymes here to break down all of our macromolecules. Remember, proteins started in the stomach, finished here. Carbohydrates started in the mouth, finished here. Lipids, very, very limited start in the stomach, finished here. And remember, like I said, for our nucleic acids, it starts and finishes here in the small intestine. So we don't get a head start on those at all. 
the breakdown of those all occurs here in the small intestine. And the pancreas is responsible for all of it. Not surprising, many of these enzymes are produced in inactive states and are activated in the small intestine, often by those brush border enzymes that I talked about. Your book actually has a great picture that shows this. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for the intermediate stages of this, but I just wanted to show you because it just emphasizes the point. Notice uh, our hormones here, for instance, the ones for our proteins like trypsin are produced by the pancreas in an inactive form that happens to be trypsinogen. And notice one of those membrane bound brush border enzymes an enteropeptidase actually clips off the end of it, activates our trypsin, I mean our trypsinogen into that active trypsin. Much like pepsin, trypsin can then help in the activation of all of the rest of these as well. And like I said, you don't need to know all these fancy inact, you know, the inactive form names or any of that, or the name of the brush border enzyme. I just wanna emphasize that again, this makes sense. We want to produce these enzymes that are going to help break down our food, but we don't want them to break down our pancreas. So we produce them in an inactive form, and then they get activated in the small intestine where they're going to be used. So like I said, you don't have to worry about these pathways. Just understand the common sense of that, uh, that we would want to make them inactive and then activate them in the small intestine. All right. Questions on that? I have a question that kind of comes from the unit review we did. Sure. Um, it was talking about gallstones and um, if like the passageway is blocked, can it get, can the bile come out in a different way? Is that? Uh, I don't remember the precise question, uh, but uh, the, uh, where can I find this? We're going to talk about this in the next class, but let's let's uh, let's quickly look at this here. Uh, I'm not going to hold you responsible for these terms right here, right now. But what this picture sort of does a nice job of showing us is the pathways that our bile can take. Out of the liver, we have two main. Oops, that color's not showing up. Two main branches that come out of the liver. They are the right hepatic duct coming out of the right side of the liver and the left hepatic duct coming out of the left side of the liver. They, not surprisingly, come together to form a duct that contains all of the bile from the liver. So it is the common hepatic duct. If there happens to be food in your small intestine at that time, it will continue down what is known as the bile duct or the common bile duct into the small intestine. If, however, there isn't any fat in your small intestine, then it will travel up the cystic duct to come to the gallbladder to be stored. And when it is stored, one of the things that happens to it when it's stored is water is drawn out of it. And that concentrates the bile, making it more efficient. However, if you are eating a no fat diet where you're never eating any fat, can that gallbladder ever release the bile? No. Or if you're eating too much fat in your diet, you could be overproducing the uh, uh, bile, where again, it sits in there for a longer time or it's more active in uh, uh, dehydrating it. And as it draws more and more water out, there is the chance that that bile can crystallize, forming that gallstone. Now, in a normal healthy individual, again, when that fat gets into our small intestine, then when that gallbladder contracts, that will come out the cystic duct into the common bile duct and be released. Notice the cystic duct can actually travel in both directions. So to answer your question, if we have a gallstone here in the gallbladder, 
And this gallstone here in the gallbladder blocks the gallbladder. Yeah, we can still get bile coming out from the liver. It won't be as concentrated, it won't be as efficient, but we can still get some bile into the small intestine. However, if that gallstone has moved down to a point where it's blocking the common hepatic duct, would there be any way for it to get out there? No. No. However, if it was small enough to get to this point, it's probably going to be passed. Most of the blockages occur where you're going from the large gallbladder into the narrow cystic duct. So, and that's the problem. When, this, when you stimulate with nerves or you stimulate it with the cholecystokinin to contract, it contracts on those pointy, sharp crystals, and you get that pain as a result of that. So as it's trying to release that bile, it's squeezing on those crystals and it can be incredibly painful. So since I would, again, I don't remember the question, so I don't remember exactly how it's worded, but since most blockages typically occur in the cystic duct, yes, bile could still get out from the liver because the gallbladder doesn't make it, it just stores it and concentrates it. Thank you. Yep. And again, we'll go over this again in the next class. But as you can see here, especially from the microscopic anatomy, the liver, as we've talked about that magic box where things happen, we're finally going to have to open up that magic box and look inside. And it's pretty elaborate. There's a fair amount of elaborate anatomy and elaborate function going on here. So that's going to take some work to do. The last thing I wanted to point out before we get to a finish for the day is, uh, let's cheat and that come back here. Again, we still have the liver to talk about and all the fun stuff for that. Come on. There we go, that's what I wanted. Well, everything going on with the liver is important. As I've mentioned, uh, you are also going to be responsible for these absorption pathways. Your book does a good job of talking about it. Our, our slides mention it, and we will go over it together. But basically, again, if you think of the job of our digestive system, the job of our digestive system is to take a fat, break it down to its basic components, get it into the body, and then send it to be processed and distributed throughout the body from there. Whether it's fats, whether it's proteins, whether it's carbohydrates. I said four, didn't I? Water. All of these need to be, well, not water, but these three need to be processed, both chemically and mechanically. And those are gonna happen in different parts of the body. We're going to talk about where those occur, how those occur, occur. We're going to talk about how these things cross the apical surface of the cell, how these things cross the basal surface of the cell, whether it goes into a blood capillary or a lymphatic capillary, and where it goes from there. Because luckily, we've learned our capillary system. We've learned our lymphatic system. So for all of these pathways, we are gonna follow the path to the right atrium. And I absolutely positively guarantee one of these pathways will be an essay question on your exam. So we're not gonna have a chance to talk about it till Tuesday, two days before the exam. But I'm warning you now, a week before the exam, that this is coming. So when we talk about this on Tuesday, should that be the first time you've heard any of this information? No. No, absolutely not. You have your textbook. You have your lab manual. You have your other resources. And hell, being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, you've got two semesters worth of previous 431 lectures on YouTube. If you were incredibly motivated, you could actually go and look at the third digestion lecture there. Watch it ahead of time. So 
be prepared for Thursday's exam. Be prepared for Tuesday's lecture. If you've got, if you've printed out the lecture notes, you see we still have a ton of stuff to cover. I don't like having a ton of stuff two days before the exam. But as I mentioned, this is usually three and a half days worth. And there are some semesters where we get four days to cover this material. But there are also some semesters like this one where we get three. So you are getting it packed in. But you have lots of resources to help you to be successful. So there's no excuses for not being successful on this exam. All right. Questions on that? All right. You have been forewarned. You have a busy weekend ahead of you. Study hard, study well. Have a good weekend. Be safe, be smart. And I will see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.